Today is February the 22nd, 2023, and it is 4.05 p.m. As a quorum of the committee is in attendance, I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Central Health Budget and Finance Committee. Um, Chair Musaiti is on her way. She's about 10 minutes, 20, 10 or 15 minutes out. So um, I will chair the meeting until she arrives. As a reminder, some of our committee members may also be participating by video conference. So staff will be managing video and audio feeds of all participants closely to make sure we have a legally compliant meeting at all times. Public communication. The first item of business is public communication. Members of the public who wish to make comments virtually during the public communications portion of the meeting must have registered with Central Health via the online forum or by telephone no later than 2.30 p.m. today. Yersinia, did anyone register to make comments for the Budget and Finance Committee? We do not have anybody signed up to make public comments. Thank you, Yersinia. We will now proceed to the committee agenda. Agenda item number one, review and approve the minutes of the January 18th, 2023 meeting of the Budget and Finance Committee. I have a motion from uh, Manager Valadez to move that the committee approve the minutes of the January 18th, 2023 meeting of the Budget and Finance Committee. I have a second from Manager Brinson. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries. Agenda item number two, receive updates on the preliminary December 2022 financial statements and pertinent information regarding financial results for January 2023 for Central Health and the Community Care Collaborative. Lisa Owens and Patty Bethke will be presenting. Good afternoon, Lisa Owens, Deputy Deputy Chief Financial Officer. <laughs> I'm uh, here tonight. Uh, I wanted to introduce Patty Bethke, our controller. She's been with us just over three years, and she's going to be joining me uh, frequently. And tonight, she'll present the Central Health Financials, and I'll present the CCC after she's completed. So, Patty? Excellent. Good afternoon, managers. I'm Patty Bethke. I'm the controller at Central Health and Community Care Clinics. Um, I just want to bring you to the first uh, slide, which is slide number four. Can't see any slides. Yeah. Rachel's got that. All right. Um, our current cash position is six hundred and thirty-four million dollars, uh, and as explained um, in the audit for the GASB eighty-seven. Um, standards that we implemented uh, this fiscal year. The lease receivables are $248 million. And our total assets, which includes cash and capital, is at $1.3 billion. This is an increase over the prior year of about $433 million. On the next slide, we'll talk about the liabilities. Our current liabilities are $198 million. We have restricted LPPF funds of $22 million held in cash as well as liabilities, and the debt service is $75 million. We'll be making a payment on the debt service at the end of this month. And as explained also in the audit on the liability section, we have um, an impact from GASB 87 of $282 million in lease payables. And our total liabilities are at 579 million. The remaining uh, net assets is the December 31st were approximately $680 million. And on the next slide, we'll talk about the sources and uses. Our property tax revenue is $114 million year to date. This is 41% of our budget. As of January 31st, our collections are 236 million, which is 84% of our budget, compared to 231 million, same time last year. 
So our collections are um, on track for this year. In healthcare delivery, our healthcare delivery for the month was about $10 million. And for the year, we're at $50 million, which includes $23 million in FY23 capital reserves. This puts us $26 million more than spent at the same time last year. Our total uses are at $56 million. And that leaves us with an excess of sources over uses at $66 million. And moving on to the next slides, um, the next set of slides, those are, um, gives us more detail about our healthcare delivery. Um, and if we move on to slide 11, in specialty care, we've spent 2.4 million in specialty care this year. That's a 51% increase over the same time last year. And with that, we're happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Um, I will take over. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm, um, I had a family emergency, so I'm almost late. Thank you for taking over. Um, thank you, Patty, and welcome. And we look forward to seeing you uh, more often with us. So I'm going to ask the board if they have any questions. No. Yes, Mr. Jones. What was that total um, assets that the uh, district has? One point. About one point three billion. One point three billion. Yeah. And that's an increase of four hundred some odd. Four hundred thirty-three million. Mm -hmm. But and, uh, keep but in mind, we have a reporting requirement change right. that is a lot of that. Right. The, the GAS, the 87 reporting requirement change has, uh, is over half of that. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Any further questions? Yes, Ms. Valdez? Not a question, but I think you want to. Great. Thank you. Look out for her email. Um, so if there's no further questions, there's no motion necessary for this item. I'm going to do the CC. Sorry, I was uh, pushing. So we are you're going to move forward yeah. with the community care. So I'll just hit some highlights of the community care collaborative. Okay, perfect. Um, and uh, so we are uh, we have shared through December that in the community care collaborative there was uh, 13.4 million dollars in assets, primarily in cash. I'm sorry, we could go to the next slide. One more, sorry, <laughs> balance sheet, thank you. Um, and then our liabilities were just over 9.5 million. Uh, much of that we've talked about many times in the past is deferred revenue as the district pr program has wound down. We still have some measures under audit, um, but uh, as you know, we've been very successful with our performance in that. Uh, so those funds are just held until that process completes. Uh, total liabilities and net assets of $13.4 million. Next slide. Um, year to date, uh, sources of funds are primarily uh, contingency carry forward and uh, interest revenue of $80,000. And our uses of funds are in our primary, I'm sorry, our healthcare delivery program, uh, just over $290,000. Uh, total uh, sources over uses at $3.7 million. And the last slide um, just provides a little more detail. Uh, primarily, the uh, healthcare delivery costs in the CCC are in the healthcare delivery operations. And um, I'm we're happy to answer questions on CCC. Any questions from board members? So I see no questions, and that means we did a great job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And as I mentioned early on for this um, item, there is no motion necessary. Thank you. So uh, we will move on to item number three. This discuss central health owned or occupied real property and potential property for acquisition, lease, or development in Travis County, including next steps in the redevelopment of the central health downtown campus administrative offices of Central Health Enterprise Partners and new developments in Eastern Travis County. 
um, Ms. McDonald and Mr. Nodal will be presenting. But um, before then, I will announce that the committee is convening in closed session to discuss ag agenda item three under Texas Government Code 551.072, deliberation regarding real uh, property and Texas Government Code Texas Government Code 551.071, consultation with attorney. And it is 416. Thank you.
So. Uh, we are out of closed session, and it is February 22nd at 4.52, and there were no, no motions necessary for this item, but um, I know the Central Health is working with, the, um, with our commissioners to set a workshop, and we look forward to that meeting soon. Now, for, the, for, uh, for our final item... Confirm the next Budget and Finance Committee meeting date and time and location. Managers, our next Central Health Budget and Finance Committee meeting will be held just before the February Board of Managers meeting at 4 p.m. on Wednesday, March 29th, 2023 at Central Health, Health, Health Headquarters, 1111 East Cesar Chavez, East Austin, Texas. At this time, I'm ready to accept a motion for adjournment. Manager Valdez? I have a second. Manager Brinson seconds. Um, all in favor? Aye. Okay. Motion carries. Uh, we will move on to our next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Bonus still after me. Uh, we will uh, continue on. We we book these back to back so that we don't have to wait for a time certain uh, to start the next meeting. So we don't have a whole lot of downtime. Uh, if anyone needs bio breaks, um, we have a full quorum, so you can sort of leave out and take care of anything you need to take care of. Um, good afternoon. Today is February twenty second, twenty twenty three, and it is. 4.54 p.m. As a quorum of the committee is in attendance, I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Central Health Executive Committee. We will receive public communication for both the Executive Committee and the Board of Managers meeting before we proceed to the Executive Committee meeting. Members of the public who wish to make comments during the public communication portion of the meeting must have registered with Central Health via the online forum or by telephone no later than 2.30 p.m. today. Yesenia, did anyone register to make comments at either the executive committee meeting or the board of managers meeting? Uh, Hi, manager. Ivan. Well, this is Ivan, and um, Yesenia had to step away, but nobody signed up. Okay, no one signed up. Thank you very much, Ivan. We appreciate Thank it. You. We will now proceed to the executive committee agenda. Agenda item number one, approve the minutes of the Central Health Executive Committee, January 25, 2023 meeting. Manager Valadez. I move that we adopt the meeting. Uh, the minutes for the January 20th. Management moves that the committee approve the minutes of the Central Health Executive Committee meeting January 25th, 2023. And do I have a second? Manager Brinson. I have a motion from Manager Valadez. I have a second from Manager Brinson. Any further discussion among the committee members? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries. 
Agenda item number two, provide and uh, review and provide direction to the staff on the prioritization and tentative scheduling of items for consideration at future Central Health Board and committee meetings. Members, there will be no presentation on this item tonight. The materials are in your backup and the staff can answer any questions on the schedule. Um, this is on page 15 in your backup. Uh, in essence, we are at the March meetings. Uh, it outlines under the column of March the agenda items that are proposed at this point in time. Um, so any further questions? Hearing none, I will proceed. Agenda item number three, discuss and take appropriate action on the process for interviewing candidates for central health board appointments to governing boards of affiliated entities and other entities as provided by law, agreement, or other mechanism. Uh, managers, in looking at how we have interviewed the last group of individuals that were interested in uh, board appointments, uh, there, there was some concern about um, the wait time um, we never know if there's going to be an emergency that we're going to have to take care of before we can come in and see them uh, and ask them questions. Um, we also find that um, probably our process is probably not as, this is from feedback, this is not me uh, <laughs> opining, um, that our process is uh, probably a little bit confusing for the uh, interviewees since it's the executive committee, but I also allow the board members to ask questions. So my suggestion is to establish an ad hoc interview committee. It will be made up of members of the board. And um, I will appoint Point those members when necessary. So in essence, when we have vacancies on boards that we need to consider, I will appoint that committee. The committee will, as you see on your document, set forth the ground rules for the committee activities, develop interview questions, including soliciting questions from all of the board members, set goals for the interview, specify for the candidates the expectations of the interviews and of being a central health appointee on the organization's board of directors and establish time certain interview appointments for the nominees to avoid lengthy time waits. So in essence, when this interview committee meets, that's the only thing on their agenda is to interview, interview the candidates. Um, the duty of the appointed committee or the appointments committee is to recommend to the full board for each open slot, a candidate for appointment. The recommendations will be, will be to the full board and the committee members, the interview committee members should be pre prepared to address questions raised by other managers who are not members of the committee. So that being my suggestion, um, I would like, uh, not at this meeting tonight, but at a future meeting to recommend to the board to establish this committee. Any questions or concerns? Manager Valadez. Thank you. I, I greatly appreciate you bringing something up that we can discuss with, with, respect, to, with respect to how we uh, make fun of a board of managers. Um, you know, we get appointed to this board by most of the city of the county. I'm a county appointee. Uh, and before you start, this is about us appointing to like community care and a Cinderella, not that's about, right. uh, okay, all right. That's I just right. wanna make sure. And, and that is an open and a public process. It's not an executive session process. It's open and it's public. We get interviewed in front of commissioners. We get in, in, interviewed in front of the public and on the city. Uh, thank you, Ben. And so whatever we say, 
It's on. Yvonne came and turned it on. Uh, so whatever it is that we say, the public hears us so they can know what kind of person we are, what character, what our character is, what our history is, what our level of involvement has been, to know whether or not we might be best suited for whatever it is that we're trying to uh, get named to or appointed to. Uh, I think that that is something, it's very open, it's a very transparent process. I think that that's something that we should adopt as a Central Health Board of Managers. When there are appointments to be made to uh, other enterprise members, I mean, other enterprise entities, including the integral care, uh, we should make that an open, transparent and public process. And the community, the public has every right to know what is discussed and how the, how the candidates or prospective candidates responded. So I'm asking whether or not there is a possibility that we can entertain uh, a public process uh, that would be made by the entire board and candidates would come before us. They provided their, res their resumes. Uh, it may be a two tiered process where it, if it, we have a hundred applications, which I doubt <laughs> that we will ever have, but if we have several applications, it may be less who are the finalists and then uh, have the finalists or maybe make that a more private setting and then the finalists will go before the board. Although I personally like pro public uh, process because we all need to know what we're dealing with, who we're dealing with. And not only that, I personally like the public to know what we as individual board members have to say and think so that they can understand how each and every, each, each of us is um, internalizing the information that we receive from each candidate. So um, I'm asking that that be considered and that before each appointment process begins, David, that the Travis County attorney, you, I guess in your role or somebody else's role, uh, assistant attorney to the Central Health Board, review with us the conflict situation and uh, duality uh, issues that may come up during that discussion. So, uh, because I am gonna tell you, I personally uh, think that we need to pay more attention to that. And there's no better way uh, for that to happen is unless it's done in an open session and we ourselves hold ourselves accountable to that level of uh, commitment to support and comply with our existing policies and procedures. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Manager Musaitik and then Manager Matwani. Yes, um, thank you. From my understanding, I'm going to say I was a city appointee. My interview was in full session. Um, and I also know that the commissioners, their interviews are in closed session. They don't televise the interviews, the commissioner court as well. I think what, what, what they make public. Yes, sir. So I will. Let me speak about my experience. So my my um, actually, uh, we have a formal council member who was who interviewed me for this position. So it was in closed session. What went public is my CV and the recommendation. I think that's what went public. So I would um, also who we interviewed to were elected officials. I don't know if the setting is also different. The bodies of the, the level of the board commitments quite a little different, but what I concur and I agree that we should have some kind of formality of a form that we can, a scorecard that um, I think in asking similar questions for all for fairness uh, of these appoint, the future appointees. So I personally, based on my experience, I would not recommend a open meeting, interview of their uh, potential um, candidates. Thank you. And to clarify, uh, it'll be Manager Matwani and then Manager Valadez, but to clarify, uh, all of our meetings, including our committee meetings, are open meetings. There may be parts of those meetings that we bring in closed session based on the legality of doing so. But anything we vote on, if I'm correct, has to be open. So in essence, David, did you want to speak no, to that? just say that's correct. That's, right. that's absolutely correct. Okay. Manager Mark Warner? Thank you. 
You got dirty hands, it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> irrespective of whether the process may be open, uh, entirely open or you know, mid midway uh, or or not, or just as we're doing it now, are these basically the kinds of recommendations you're asking for? Uh, is it, would you be looking for these kinds of distilled sort of feedback whenever this were to come back as a recommendation in the future? Yes. Okay. And if you have additional after we finish here, because it's not going to come up until next meeting. We would talk about it then. So you, you can talk about it then or send me your brilliant your comments and then I can add them. Manager of Validance. Thank you, Mayor. Um I apologize. I'm not misunder. I didn't misstate what I said. Uh, if there was any misunderstanding, the Travis County Commissioner process for the selection of a, uh, an appointment to this board is very public. And I even taped myself getting interviewed um, because it is done in public. I think there was 96 people that applied when I did. That was brought down to like 24, then 16, then the four finalists or what appeared before the commissioners in a very public setting. Uh, so I think I'm referring to that. Uh, maybe that's why I was saying uh, possible tiered uh, process, but the finalists should be um, interviewed in a public setting so that uh, we can, uh, and the public will have an opportunity to, to review what it is we're talking about and the, the level of, um, I guess, qualifications that each individual candidate may have that we're considering for those possible appointments. Thank you. Thank you, Manager Kitchen. Um, I'm thinking that 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 um, you know public process can be accommodated with the process that you're talking about. So I, I do think it's helpful. This the city doesn't do a public process. <laughs> at all no so that those of you who are involved in that understand that um but i think it's useful you sure. know so but i think that that can be determined as as part of uh, as part of a you know a committee process because okay. the committee's open and i think the committee process is is a useful process totally agree. thank you i'm sorry uh manager mark so uh, to me to economize that i think that, that there's an element where you we trust each other and we i think the idea of bringing it forward to the entire group to vote on makes her a lot more efficiency in terms of getting someone uh as just as, as Manager Stan said earlier, you know, the CVs are out, the recommendations are out for public viewing. Mm -hmm. um, I just would foresee it much like if the President of the United States had to go requesting for every Department of Energy approval I and mean, all these different things from um, for his cabinet appointments, per se. Uh, I just think that efficiencies would, uh, I think this is a very efficient manner in which to do it. So, Thank you, Dr. Mark. Any other comments or questions? Uh, Manager Jones. Uh, I just have a, a recommendation, and this is more after the uh, selection, is that on a routine basis, any appointee by the board, this board be required at least on an annual basis to come back and report back the operational concerns, issues, or things that we would probably have already heard but it's better if you're holding someone accountable to that. So as we go through the process, I would encourage you to look at the opportunity to be able to inculcate that into some of the expectation of the interview process so they would be aware. That is a standard standing recommendation. Thank you, uh, Manager Jones. And I think that that would be part of the committee's duty to sort of add that to the expectations of the candidate, both for the interview and for their for their period of time serving as a board of director. And so that can truly be added. And their failure to do that, we might want to consider some kind of penalty. Well, that would, again, that would be a, 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 a part of the committee process. Uh, Manager Martin. If I may mention it, I mean, my very first interview session was the last group we had. I 
And I uh -huh. think that once again, directing it to a group that's dedicated to review the CVs in depth, to come up with a good list of questions that are relevant to that individual. Because I was honestly somewhat at a loss. It's just sort of, I had received the CVs, but I didn't really know enough about it. And sure. I think that would really have a focus committee to come up with questions um, and expectations uh, would be a much more an efficient process. <laughs> I think it would be beneficial on both sides yeah. for us as well as for the candidates. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Any further comments or questions? Uh, Sorry. Manager. Sorry, oh, no problem. But, but to manage the validators, I concur, is that we need to make sure that in the open environment, that people who are being appointed understands and the public hears that there are enterprises with, uh, within central health. And so that's an opportunity to make sure that we get the message about our operational modus operandi versus the fact that uh, we're just appointing someone to board. They're part of us. Correct. So and in I, essence, the alignment issue that I think we talk about a lot with regard to central health and, I, and, and the other entities. I, and yeah, and I think we need to you know, make that part of our habit of, of ensuring that message gets out. Okay. Thank you. Those were great suggestions. And like I said, when we come back, we'll address those in, in the recommendation for the full board. Um, I think, uh, David, I need a motion on this. Um, I need a motion to recommend that the board approve the process for interviewing candidates for the uh, external appointments as presented. Uh, and with the additional uh, recommendations made by the board members, uh, including approval of the formation and functions of the ad hoc appointments committee created by the board chair. I move that the committee recommend that the board approve the process for interviewing candidates for external appointments as presented, including approval of the formation and functions of the ad hoc appointment committee created by the board chair. I have a motion to have a second. Uh, I have a motion from Manager Musaiti. I have a second from Manager Brinson. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries. Okay. Agenda item number four: Discuss and take appropriate action on the appointment of one member to the governing board of the Sendero Health Plans. I'd like to announce that the committee is convening in closed session to discuss agenda item number four under the Texas Government Code section 551.074, personnel matters. It is Wednesday, February the 22nd, and it is 5.14 p.m.
members of the public and members, we are out of closed session. It is Wednesday, February 22nd at 545 p.m. The item number four, uh, discussion of appropriate actions on the appointment of one member to the governing board of the Central Health Plans. Um, requires a motion, and I'm looking for a motion of the executive commissioner, excuse me, the executive committee recommends that the board approve the appointment of Mackenzie Frazier, who is a general plan, health plan board of directors, to fill the unexpired term of Dr. Charles Bell, who will transition to being an ex officio. So moved. I have a motion from Manny to be signed. Do I have a second? I need one from a committee member. No, oh, sorry. I second it. Thank you. I have a motion from Manager Musaiki. If I have a second from Manager Valadez. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Show Manager Valadez to be abstaining and the motion carries. Okay. Uh, excuse me. Oh, Mr. Fraser is not here. No. Oh. Okay. Managers, um, yes. So, so that recommendation is on the board. To the board. You'll see it on the agenda in a few minutes. <laughs> All right. Agenda item number five, confirm the next regular executive committee meeting date, time, and location. Managers, our next Central Health Executive Committee meeting is tentatively scheduled for Wednesday, March 29th, 2023 at 5 p.m. at Central Health Administrative Offices, 1111 East Cesar Chavez Street, Austin, Texas, 78702. At this time, I'm ready to accept a motion for adjournment. Manager Valadez? I have a second. I have a motion for Manager Valadez. I have a second for Manager Musaitif. Any, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We are adjourned. Okay, managers. Um, again, we will go right into the Board of Managers meeting. Um, good evening, again. Today is still February the 22nd, 2023, and it is 5.47 p.m. As a quorum of the board is in attendance, I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Central Health Board of Managers. The first item of business will be the consent agenda. Consent agenda C1, approve the minutes of the Central Health Board of Managers meeting uh, January, excuse me, Approve the minutes of the Central Health Board of Managers January 25th, 2023 meeting. C2, receive and ratify the Central Health Investments for January 2023. C3, approve the Central Health President and CEO's performance evaluation tool for 2023 or other timeframes as may be appropriate. C4, approve the Central Health Key Legislative Priorities as recommended by the Strategic Planning Committee, and C5, receive and take appropriate action on, the on a resolution approving an amendment to the bylaws of the Sendero Health Plans Incorporated regarding ex officio members of the Sendero Board of Directors, and C6, approve the appointment of a new member to the Sendero Health Plans Board of Directors as recommended by the Executive Committee. Do I have a motion? Manager Valerie. I move that the board uh, approve uh, consent agenda item C1. I, I have a motion from Manager Valadez. Do I have a second? Manager, Manager Martin. I have a motion from Manager Valadez. I have a second from Manager Martin. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Please show Manager Jones as abstaining. And the motion is approved. We will now proceed to the regular agenda. Members, we will not be taking up posted item number five this evening. That item was receive and discuss updates on the web. Medicaid 
waiver delivery system for storm and entertainment district program and associated projects the community care collaborative and other health care delivery partners programs projects and arrangements including agreements with ascension texas and the university of texas at austin at this time i would entertain a motion to limit debate on all items in the regular agenda for our meeting this evening manager validance to three minutes per member per item do i have a second I have a motion from Manager Valadez. I have a second from Manager Musaiti. Any further discussion? Manager Jones. How do, we, how do we enforce that? We keep time. When they go beyond the time? We stop them. <laughs> or, <laughs> or ask if they would entertain a motion to be uh, waived. That you always have that. Yeah. According to Robert's rule. You do. Sure. Should we keep them on? That's You're not on. But should we keep them on? Yeah. Okay. It's an answer question. Did we vote? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Show Manager Jones as, absta as abstaining. Motion carries. Agenda item number one, receive an update on fiscal year 2023 budget resolution priorities, including but not limited to expansion of specialty care services, enhancement of behavioral health, substance abuse treatment, and methadone services, and continued implementation of Central Health's direct practice of medicine, including transitions of care programs. Mike Keesland will be introducing this item and there will be other speakers who will be presenting. Mr. Keesland. Thank you, members. Uh, members this evening, you're going to hear reports uh, from a lot of uh, many colleagues at, at Central Health that have been working on the items that the board has identified through the budget resolution as being strategic objectives. And uh, as you all know, you adopt the budget, you adopt the budget resolution, and that's what brings the funds and the resources together with the uh, stated objectives and priorities, and that's what we focus on. And so really what you're seeing tonight is the first of many reports that you'll get throughout the fiscal year that this board had approved that report scheduled through the executive committee process uh, last month, but uh, this is the first uh, inaugural set of reports, but I wanted to make the connection with the funds that you all entrust us with and then the objectives that you all set, but then coming back and being accountable uh, for those funds and those objectives, but also being transparent with the public so that they can see this is what we're doing to uh, bring access to health care for those who need it most. Thank you. Alan. And I, I'm sorry, I should be more formal. Instead of just saying, hey, Alan. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'll now turn it over to Alan Schultz, the Chief Medical Officer. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, Board of Managers. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. All Thank right. You. Thank you. Um, we are absolutely thrilled to be here. Um, thanks for the opportunity to share our some of our clinical initiatives. Um, I'll start again. We are that thrilled um, to be here. Thanks for the opportunity for us to share some of our clinical initiatives um, with you all. Um, I was hoping to share some functional information um, with, uh, with the Board of Managers as related to our presentation. Um, first of all, there will be a couple um, slightly graphic images that will occur mostly in the podiatric section um, of our presentation today for folks who may be somewhat sensitive um, two images we wanted to kind of give you a heads up. The purpose of those images is really to illustrate, number one, the complexity of our patients. Number two, the skill sets of our provider um, care teams. And number three, the fact that there still is a lot of work to do. Um, secondly, um, our teams will present in kind of a dyad format. So we'll have a clinical subject matter expert present with their operational partner. This works in a very similar manner to the way John and I work, but anytime we delineate or develop 
um, clinical initiatives if we have our subject matter experts sitting um, in partnership with our operational um, our operational colleagues, we're much more likely to be successful as related to advocating for the patient. There will also be times where there's a triad when we bring nursing leadership and staff into that environment. And that way we build out our clinical initiatives um, with stakeholders sitting at the table. The other request, uh, Chairman Bell, if you would please consider, if we could please consider holding questions to the end of the presentation, um, the gifted folks sitting to my right are gonna share as much information as time is permitted with you all. And we're hoping that there are a lot of questions, but I think if we ask questions after any one of the presentations, our fear is that we actually don't get to the other presentations. So please, would you take that into consideration, sir? Quite well taken, sir. I appreciate that. Thank you, Dr. Shalsha. Uh, good evening, board. Um, as Mike mentioned, the purpose of tonight's presentation is to provide an update on the FY23 budget resolution that you all passed uh, along with the budget back in September. Uh, more specifically, we will uh, present on four areas or four strategic priorities from that uh, budget resolution. And of course, in future meetings, we'll touch on other strategic priorities. But tonight, um, our presentation will touch on the expansion of specialty care services, both contracted and direct services. Uh, the enhancement of behavioral health and substance use treatment, including methadone services, the continued implementation of central health direct practice of medicine, um, and the expansion of transitions of care programs within central health practice of medicine. I will quickly introduce uh, our colleague, Cynthia Gallegos, for any of you that have not uh, met Cynthia previously. She's our vice president of operations and uh, oversees our network of contracted services as well as the operations side of our new, uh, newly forming direct practice of medicine, um, among many other areas. So uh, I will turn it over to Cynthia to introduce uh, our first set of speakers. Thank you, John. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for allowing me the honor to introduce the team members that have been a lot in front of some really heavy lifted work. Um, to clarify, am I starting with only the first presentation or can I go through the whole? All right, I had plans to introduce everybody. Um, so I get the honor to introduce my colleague, Margarito Flores, who has been uh, instrumental into our dialysis program work. Uh, we've got Dr. Uh, Garrett Nielsen uh, as part of our surgical podiatry team that will be speaking to our surgical podiatry work alongside his colleague, uh, Dr. Brittany Kalapak. Uh, we've also got uh, Nelly Terrazas, um, who has been instrumental into our, um, our dialysis work as well. She is our program coordinator. Uh, we've also got Dr. Himali Patel, who is the director of transitions of care here with Central Health. Really excited to see her presentation. Um, and then we've also got Dr. Audrey Kwong, who has helped lead up all of our medical respite work. Um, her title is director of a special high-risk populations. Um, and then lastly, we've got Dakasha Leonard, who has been instrumental in a lot of our transitions of care work alongside our medical respite work. Um, and she is a service delivery operations manager. So as Dr. Schulcher mentioned, this is um, a really important team that has been at the front of a lot of the work that you're going to be listening to today. So thank you for that honor. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. Good evening. Um, as Cynthia mentioned, my name is. Can you turn it off? I can't figure it out either. There we go. There we go. All right. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Margarito Flores, and as Cynthia mentioned, um, I'm a director of operations, and I lead our uh, specialty, uh, specialty care services here at Central Health. Um, tonight, I have the distinct pleasure of really speaking to you guys about our, our dialysis program. Uh, I wanted to provide you guys with a brief overview of kind of what, our, what does our program entail, talk to you guys a little bit of our timeline, and then we wanted to give you guys a brief profile of who our patients are and those that we're serving. So once again, we're very excited about this opportunity. Um, so first of all, uh, going on to the next slide, uh, next one after that, 
Uh, one more, there you go. So uh, first of all, uh, as you guys know, we created this program with really having the goal of being able to provide a consistent dialysis uh, services to our MAP patients uh, with the ultimate goal of transitioning them to an ultimate payer. Um, since the beginning of our program, our, really our mission has uh, been quite simple. We want to improve the quality of life of our patients while in, improving the longevity, uh, while also being able to decrease unnecessary utilization to a hospital. Now, for some of the, you guys that may not know, our MAP patients have, have historically uh, received their dialysis services uh, through the hospitals through their compassionate services. Um, thankfully, due to our efforts and arrangement, we've been able to create partnerships with not only the dialysis centers, but also with some ambulatory surgical centers so that patients can not only just receive the dialysis services, but are also able to uh, receive the procedures that they need for their vascular uh, access for dialysis treatment. Now, in terms of our eligibility, we really have three main criteria that we look for in terms of patients being enrolled into our program. The first is patients must have an ESRD diagnosis, which is end-stage renal disease. Second, they may of course be um, MAP active patients and be able to go through our enrollment process. And then finally, um, those patients must agree to be able to transition to an alternate payer when the time comes and that they are eligible. And the milestones, I'll go through some of the major milestones here in the next slide. So next slide, please. Thank you. And as you can see, I really want to highlight a few of the milestones that, that we we're able to accomplish throughout this last year. So as you guys could see in June, in June 2022, we were able to enroll our first patient who went through our, our eligibility and enrollment process. In July of 2022, we're happy to say that our very first patient that we had actually received services at, at one of the dialysis centers. And from July to December of 2022, as Nelly's gonna be able to talk a little bit more about here in the, in the coming slides, we're able to enroll 25 patients into our program in just a very few uh, first months. Now, as I mentioned before, an important component that we look for in this dialysis program is to be able to transition them to an alternate payer during open enrollment. And I will, of course, give kudos here to Nelly and the team that all of the 25 patients that we had were successfully transitioned to an alternate payer during that open enrollment. Of course, as you guys can imagine, that allows us an opportunity to continue taking on more patients. And in January of this year, we began our new cohort of patients. And I think currently we're about uh, a little bit less than five, but of course, actively receiving referrals. So once again, uh, thank you guys for this opportunity. And I'll hand it over to Nelly to talk a little bit about the patient profile and, and those that we're serving. Yeah, thank you, Margarita. Um, Again, my name is Nelly Terrazas, and I am the program specialist for the uh, Central Health Transitional Dialysis Program. Um, and I just want to say that it's been truly a great pleasure um, serving this patient population. Um, I just want to share a little bit um, about the patients that we are, um, that we have served, and and just talk about a little bit about the patients that we are serving now. Um, as you can see from this slide, um, last year we were able to enroll 25 patients into our um, central health dialysis program. Um, and then um, at the time, I keep, mm, sorry, I keep, That's okay. Yeah, okay. And then um, at the time that this data was collected um, this year so far, um, we've been able to enroll less than five patients. Um, and then as part of our dialysis program, as Margarito mentioned, um, we help coordinate the procedures needed for treatment, such as vascular access. And this includes fistula placements and any revisions that are needed um, while they're receiving treatment. Um, so last year, we were able to help um, 13 patients get fistulas um, where before they had um, catheter access. Um, and then... Um, so we also work really closely with the satellite dialysis clinics. We try to accommodate these patients as best we can. So where they're able to receive treatments in clinics that are like served them best logistically. Um, so if you can see from this slide, this slide here that um, Metric, Mueller and Round Rock are the most popular locations with Metric and Mueller uh, being more like centralized locations. And then the Round Rock location serves like our uh, patient population that lives a little bit further up north. Um, and then uh, we have just also recently started um, enrolling patients into the tech Ridge location, which is also central, uh, north located. Um, and so this is also going to kind of help offset some of those patients that are going to be going into Round Rock. Maybe we can start enrolling them into uh, tech Ridge.
Um, so we, um, we are continuing to bring up awareness about our program with over um, 50 referrals last year. And then um, one of the biggest successes of our program, I feel, is that we have been able to um, establish like a really quick turnaround time for uh, to enroll patients into our program. Um, today, from the time that we receive the referral to the time that we're able to verify eligibility to the time that we're able to get a patient in a chair, it's about seven dates. Is how long it's taking right now. Um, and then as you can see from this slide as well, um, since not since we received 50 referrals, not everyone that is referred is um, has been able to enroll into our program. Um, and that could be for multiple reasons, whether they um, they're eligible or they're, they qualify for an alternate payer, which we help them enroll in, um, or they didn't necessarily meet the eligibility criteria or they didn't quite have that end-stage renal disease diagnosis, rather they had um, a CKD4 or a CKD5. And then it's really important to remember that the CKD4s and the CKD5s patients that have been referred, um, we tend to just kind of keep an eye on them. And then once they do transition into end-stage renal disease, we're able to enroll them into our program. Okay. Um, and then, as you can see from this snapshot, um, most of our patients have been male with an average age of like 44 years. And then women make up 34% of our enrollees with an average age of 58 years. Um, the average time from diagnosis to enrollment in this bottom chart in the corner um, says that it's been 3.3 months. So it's really important to take into consideration as well that when our program started in June, um, these patients were already going to the hospital to receive emergent dialysis, um, and this data actually reflects that information, and that's why it says it is 3.3 months from the time that they were diagnosed to the time that they were able to get enrolled. Um, so now that our program is live, um, we, hope to, um, we hope to improve those numbers and, and, and decrease the time. Um, so most of our patients, according to the slide, um, are established at community care, um, with the remaining having been established at People's, uh, People's Community Care Clinic. Um, as mentioned before, um, one of the goals of our program is to help transition these patients to an alternate payer. Um, and, and in the slide, you can see that 96% um, of our patients were successfully transitioned to Sendero, and through a little over 3% were uh, successfully transitioned over to Medicaid. Um, so finally, um, we want to speak about the work that we have been uh, we have coming up. Um, first, we want to continue to focus to spread awareness about Central Health Transitional Dialysis Program, um, and to just continue to educate our partners um, on the process and the criteria for our program. Um, secondly, um, we want to. Um, we want to be able to measure patient experience and see how much their quality of life has improved um, from the time of receiving or starting dialysis, um, and then and how this program has impacted their life. Thank you. And last but not least, of course, um, as Nelly mentioned, we're continually evaluating the different partnerships that we have to determine what are the right sites for our patients and what other services can we provide for them. So this is an ongoing uh, quality improvement that, that we work for this. And of course, I think uh, we are still in the very early stages of this program, but we're really looking forward to all the improvements that we'll make in the next year in the future. So, um, so that's it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah. And you guys have done a tremendous job for such a short period of time. Thank that you. is yes. it's totally excellent. Um, I'm going to let all the questions happen after it's over, as requested by Dr. Shalsa. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm very happy. I had the distinct pleasure of also talking about our podiatry surgical services. So, of course, as as uh, Brittany as uh, uh, Cynthia mentioned right now, that we have Dr. Nielsen and Dr. Kalapak here joining us to talk about the, the podiatry surgical. And uh, you know, I've worked on quite a few initiatives, and this one I, I especially take a lot of pride in because I feel that uh, this program really is helping pave the way for us as we tra begin transforming into our direct practice of care. So, once again, uh, I'm very excited about this. Um, just wanted to give you guys very quickly uh, onto the next slide. Um, uh, I'll just be providing a brief overview of kind of what our program entails, and then I'll hand it over to Dr. Kalapak to speak about um, some of the metrics 
uh, speak about our timeline. And then uh, Dr. Nielsen has a very interesting and very uh, uh, good patient story that he wants to share with us. So once again, as we mentioned, our podiatry surgical services currently uh, service both MAP and MAP basic population. Um, we currently have three surgical locations to our podiatrists currently perform surgeries out of. Of course, that's uh, Del Seton Medical Center, Seton, uh, Seton, Maine, and then Central Park Surgery Center. And then, of course, from the operations, I think that we've been able to work and collaborate very closely with not only the surgery sites, but also with community care and others to ensure that we have a good referral process post-op procedures and making sure that we're really taking care of the patients and providing the wraparound services that they need that may include anything with dietitians, behavior health or things along those lines. So uh, with that being said, um, I'll hand it over to Dr. Calvert. Thank you. Um, so I'm really just gonna go over the timeline here of when we started. Um, we started January of last year with uh, Seton Medical. And then later that month, we added on Dell Seton um, March, we started Central Park uh, Surgery Center, and then we were lucky we got to add Math Basic, which allowed us to see a lot more patients for surgery in October of last year. Um, uh, and then our first um, Math Basic patient uh, actually had surgery on January 9th. And then next slide. Okay, so we've done 23 total surgeries, and that's an old number. We've added on to that. Um, the surgical locations, um, we do most of our, our surgeries at Central Park, the surgery center. Um, second is Seton, Maine, and then uh, third is Del Seton. Um, the top three diagnoses we do surgery on have been bunions, um, then wound, limb salvage, and then um, soft tissue masses. Um, time to surgery. So this is once they've gotten um, pre-op um, pre risk stratification is about one to two weeks to the surgery center and then about three to four weeks for the hospital. Okay. Um, next is Willis. All right, thank you. And once again, we're very excited. Am I the one controlling this? Well, they're controlling it. Okay. So I have no, for okay. us. I'll give you one of these. All right. <laughs> All right, we're very excited to be here. Uh, as Alan mentioned, this is a surgical case. I think it's important to show, uh, actually, I don't think this has the pictures on it. So uh, let's see, can you go to the next slide? Oh yeah, it doesn't have the pictures. So, um, well, you guys are saved because there's nothing uh, graphic. <laughs> So, which is unfortunate, but so we had a patient and this is, uh, we wanted to share a case because it shows just the impact that we can have. Uh, many of our patients have been dealing with chronic wounds. Yeah. Oh, oh, they have the picture oh, in the packet. Okay, yes. all right. So yeah, we'll stay on this slide. Okay, so this is a patient well-known to our clinic. He's 65, has a history of diabetes, has a history of a bone infection. Uh, and because of that bone infection, he has a subsequent amputation of his toe. Uh, he's had a wound on the bottom of his foot for approximately three years now. Uh, so he is an at-risk patient. Uh, local wound care has failed. Uh, we tried, you know, conservative treatment options. He also uh, works and he's the primary uh, provider for some family members here, as well as he sends money back to his, uh, back to Mexico. So he's very worried that something could go wrong. He could land up in the hospital and miss work and then ultimately lose his job. Now, one of the things that I like about podiatry is we get to take a step back and actually look and see what's actually going on. If you look at your pictures, there's a picture of a wound, right? And it's very easy to get like tunnel vision and just think, okay, there's the wound. This is how we're going to treat it. This is what we're going to do. But really, why is the wound occurring? We can treat that and it's just going to happen again and again. So surgically, we can go in and perform different uh, treatments to ultimately heal this wound. All right, can we go to the next slide? Yeah. Oh, all right. So um, as I mentioned, so um, with his, this particular patient, he had a tight uh, Achilles tendon. And when your Achilles is tight, you're going to put more pressure on your forefoot. So you're going to be angled like this instead of like this when you walk. He also had some bones, his metatarsal bones were angled down towards the ground more than normal. And this was causing also some excess pressure. You can see where he's getting his wounds. That's the issue. 
Now he can't miss much work. So we have to be a little creative with this and figure out what we can do to get him back to work fast, but ultimately fix his problem biomechanically and get him back to work and get him healed. So the next slide shows, uh, yeah, could you go to the one after that? The next slide shows our surgical plan, which all you need to know is we lengthen the Achilles tendon. We also um, perform some osteotomies, which are bone cuts in certain angles so that we could lift up those metatarsal bones. All this is doing is releasing and, and cutting down the pressure on his forefoot. So his surgery was in early October. Uh, if you go to the next uh, page, it says day of surgery, but that's about 10 days post-op. Um, now, he's been walking in that for about seven days. He went back to, to work three days later. Now, if you look at the next picture, that's 30 days post-op. And that is beautiful because you, you see those, those calluses are pretty much going away. There's not those prominent bones that are, that are causing his calluses and his ulcerations. If you go to the next slide, you see in the, the picture to the right is four months post-op. And he has beautiful new skin, soft, there's no calluses. That is a functional foot that is going to change his life. He's coming into wound care sometimes every other week, but sometimes weekly for three years. So that's a stress. That's a stress on him financially with his work schedule. He's managing two jobs, sending money back home. So I'm very proud of this program because we can affect lives like that. Um, so we also are putting together a, a um, patient satisfaction survey because we want to make this as streamlined as possible and as smooth and easy as possible. The easier we can make it, the more patients we can see, the more good results we can have. So we're in the process of that. And once we get feedback, we can make changes as needed. But we thank you for your time. And we're very uh, proud of where we're at. And we're going to keep going and, and provide good results. That is excellent, and uh, you know, sorry about the friction. That is such critical care for our diabetics, and so um, having that ability to look at, um, you know, the actual cause of what's causing those particular ulcers and pressure points—that's fantastic. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much for having us. We are also very honored to be here to talk about Central Health Medical Respite Program. Um, so next slide. Um, so some of you may know what medical respite is, but just so we can all be on the same page, a uh, medical respite program is for people who are experiencing homelessness to give uh, this individual a safe place to heal and recuperate. Um, I think the best example of this is for patients who are coming out of the hospital. When you come out of the hospital, most of us just need to lay in our bed and you know rest a little bit. But when you're experiencing homelessness, that is not an option. So if you're getting discharged from the hospital and you're going to the streets, there is a 50% chance that you will get readmitted. Some patients will be able to go to a nursing home and that's great. They'll get physical therapy and get better. But then if you go back to the streets, you'll probably get readmitted. So, so to break this cycle, um, medical respite programs were created and Central Health was able to bring this program to Austin uh, last year. Um, so uh, our respite program is located at a new entry. And so you can see from this picture, rather than getting discharged to the street, um, we, we could go to this facility. Um, next. Uh, so our medical respite program, again, is located in New Entry. It is a residential treatment program that is located in East Austin on Weberville Road. Um, and it basically provides a bed that you can stay in all day to rest and three meals a day, um, transportation to your appointments, coordination. Um, and so next slide. To put this kind of in perspective, this is Mr. P, our very first respite patient. Um, he is a 64-year-old man who was uh, unfortunately hit by a car and broke over 10 bones in his body, including his legs, his arms, his back. And you can see that he was very sick because he spent 40 days in the hospital and then had to go to a nursing home to recuperate for another uh, six weeks, essentially. Um, if this program didn't exist, he would have probably been discharged to the streets, but he was able to go to the medical respite program where he stayed for 50 days. While he was there, he continued to get physical therapy. Our social worker there helped him with benefits. He got disability at that time. And then after 50 days, he moved into this, his tiny home at Community First Village. 
Um, and if you're a Facebook follower of Camille Bird Village, um, he was spotted on February 9th shopping at the um, at the food pantry, um, and it was really neat to see him. And I still see him. He's my patient when I go to Community First Village on Fridays, and he's doing great and very grateful. So just some numbers. We are about to celebrate our one-year anniversary, but in the first 11 months of our program, we admitted 59 patients, um, and that is only with one staff member. So since then, we've grown. But with one staff member, we were able to admit 59 patients. We took about 60% of our patients from nursing homes, um, another 29% from our healthcare for the homeless team, so patients who are coming to the ARCH, to our, um, our mobile team, our street team, and then 10% came from the hospital. And that was by design. We wanted to start small, go slow, learn, and then open it up to the hospitals, which we're hoping to do this year. Um, and just some demographics, the average age was 52, uh, about three quarters were men. Um, and you can see the breakdown in demographics, 60% uh, Anglo, 20% Black, 14% Hispanic. Um, the top diagnosis may not be a surprise. Number one is fractures, fractures all over the body, um, usually from accidents, uh, some from assault. The second one was cancer, um, lots of different types of cancer. Um, the third most common diagnosis this past year was end-stage renal disease, which also tied for infections and then heart failure. And I think when you think about these diagnoses, there is very, it is very hard to heal from anything on the street, let alone maintain your health. And so this program really allowed individuals to get the care that they needed. Um, next slide. So um, this is just to show the length of stay. Um, the average length of stay in our program was about 30 days. Um, and our goal was not just to heal a medical condition, but to get them better and sort of change that trajectory of their homeless status. Um, and so we had about a quarter complete the program. And then another quarter of them were administra administratively discharged. So there was something that happened where they had to, they were asked to leave. Now that the average length of stay for those who are administra administratively discharged was still 17 days. That's pretty good. That's a good amount of time to heal. And one guy actually stayed 131 days before he was asked to leave. Um, and then we also had something called self-discharge. So about 30% left, but they on average left after about 11 days with us, which I still think is a, a win. Um, and I often say we let them break up with us before we broke up with them um, because uh, we, and I, the other thing I would say is when you look at other respite programs across the country, Boston's respite program, their length of stay is 14 days in LA, it's 21 days. So we are above that because one of our goals is to really help people with housing and not just um, heal a medical condition, but also figure out, you know, what's the next step for them. Um, for the people that, uh, you know, we were able to get into housing, 50% um, went into transitional housing, uh, about 36% went into permanent housing, and then 14% with friends and family. Um, okay, so this is some hospital utilization data. Um, for those individuals who were with us at least six months, we did a look back. So how many times were they in the hospital before they came to respite? And then how long were they, how many times did they have come into the hospital um, in the six months following coming to respite? Um, and what was really cool, so in the blue is ED visits. There was about a 60% reduction in ED visits after someone came to the hospital and a 75% reduction in uh, hospital days, inpatient days. Um, and that is... Uh, not too surprising to me, we have a lot of patients like our dialysis patients who go to the hospital every time they need dialysis. We have a patient with cirrhosis who went to the hospital every time he needed to get his abdomen drained. So there was a lot of um, these kind of admissions. And so it's really neat to see that once coming to respite, they don't have to use the ER or the hospital anymore. Uh, next slide. In addition to medical things, we also like to help with social needs. So this slide really shows all the other things that our social worker helps our patients with. And I like to think that they're a captive audience and we can, um, it's normally a lot harder to help patients when they're um, unsheltered and they don't have phones. So when they're with us um, and they're hanging out, we can start to work on some of these things. So um, in each of these six categories, the first line would be a new connection. We were able to make a referral. The second line is they already had it. And then the third is they either weren't eligible or weren't interested. So you can see there were a lot of great social connections with SNAP benefits, ID cards, Metro Access, coordinate assessment, and substance abuse referrals, and mental health referrals, which is really neat. All right, so this is a patient um, of mine, and I just wanted to highlight that we always we don't always take patients from the hospital. This is a 64-year-old gentleman that I met while I was working at the Arch, and his wife unfortunately died in a fire 
Um, so their, their apartment had a fire, she passed away, he got, and he became homeless in, in, during those events. Um, and he eventually found his way to the arch where I met him. Um, he had cataracts, I referred him to Optho, and then I didn't really hear anything else. And then come in the fall, I, we get this referral saying they wanna operate, but he needs a place to be. So we were able to bring him into respite. He successfully completed his uh, cataracts removal, and now he can see. And I think it's, this is a picture of him that our social worker took because he was so excited for his surgery. Um, and I can imagine why, because it's great to have his sight back. Um, and then the next slide. Um, people tell me I tell too many stories, but please bear with me. I want to show the numbers, but I think the stories are also very important. So on the upper left is our gentleman who has cirrhosis, and you can see from his abdomen that he has um, what we call ascites fluid buildup. In 2021, from one hospital alone, Del Seton, he had 11 ED visits and one hospitalization. In 2022, he had 10 ED visits and six hospitalizations. He came to respite for 120 days, um, and the challenge was he just couldn't take his um, diuretics, the medication that helps to control that fluid, because he was on the streets. And you really can't take diuretics when you're um, living on the streets. So when he came into rest, and so he was going into the hospital every week to get his abdomen drained, seven to 10 liters. Um, he came uh, to respite. We were able to get him on the medication. And after two months, he, he did not need any of those procedures because he could control the fluid in his belly with the medication alone, which was really, really great. Um, so he's been with us. He's been, um, uh, and he just got approved for housing. And next week, he'll be going to Community First Village to pick out his tiny home. So that's really exciting. This gentleman in the middle is a 65-year-old day laborer who has diabetes and has not been able to afford or take his insulin, terrible diabetes. He got a cut on his left hand, which got worse very quickly and had to get an amputation of his uh, of a part of his arm. Um, so he came to respite after being in the hospital for a month for the infection. Um, and while he was um, at respite, we were able to get him into all these appointments to help him get fitted for a prosthesis. Um, so now three months later at respite, um, we've gotten his diabetes under control. And two weeks ago, he picked up his prosthesis and he's working with OT to help um, learn how to use that. So that's really great. Uh, the, the lady on the right, we love her. She keeps her room clean and she's like the den mom. Um, she uh, she uh, is a woman who lives with HIV and uh, she developed a wound on her leg. And being immunocompromised, that wound could get pretty bad pretty quick. So the clinic called us and said, could she come and stay so she could stay off her feet and get antibiotics? And so she's been with us and her, her wound is now healed and we're helping her find housing. The gentleman on the bottom left has been my patient for many years and I, um, I'm a big fan of him and I have not been able to really help him because he doesn't have a phone and he's been experiencing homelessness and his diabetes is terrible. Um, and so I said, hey, why don't you come over to respite for two weeks? Let's just like let you have a break from being on the streets and all the stress. And so before he came to respite, his hemoglobin A1C, that's a measure of your diabetes. We like it to be less than seven if we can. His was 12. And when he came to respite, he got to rest. He got to be able to like think about his life and you know, just start to focus on his health. And a month later, when I saw him in clinic, his A1C was down to 8.5. And then last week when I saw him, it's down to 6.5. So incredible. And then this guy on the right, I met him at the Arch five years ago, and it has been so hard. He's got so many things going on with his heart, his liver, and it's so hard to coordinate all these visits. He kept missing all these cardiology appointments I was making for him. And uh, two weeks ago when I got, he came to respite as well for, for just a respite. So we could coordinate all his um, GI appointments, his cardiology appointments, his MRIs, all these things he needed. And uh, two weeks ago, I was at Community First Village. And I was like, hey, what are you doing here? And he said, I live here now. And I was like, wow, like I, I, this one is so special to me because I think being a provider on the front line, we see a lot of secondary trauma. We live what our patients are living. In, and, and so to see him now housed um, and getting the help that he needs was just tremendous. And so I've been doing medical respite for over 15 years, healthcare for the homeless, and it uh, never ceases to amaze me the simple um, impact of how a bed can change your health, the profound impact of just having a place to be, whether it's two weeks, three months, you can, you know, change your, basically change your life. And so I'm so grateful to be able to be a part of this program um, and to Central Health for really uh, supporting this. Uh, next slide. 
So I just wanted to just shout out our team. Um, on the left is our social worker who's been holding the fort down for the last year. So he's been our, um, he has, uh, was part of integral care, part of the MCOT team, then was a social worker at Del Seton. On the right um, is our nurse that we just hired two months ago. And she was a, a home health nurse for hospice. She's a wound care certified. She worked also at St. David. So we have an all-star rock star team. We just hired an MA. Um, and now I'm gonna hand it over to Takasha. Thank you. All right. So I'll just kind of briefly uh, go over where we started from and where we are today. Um, we started our partnership with the new entry last year in March. Um, we started with five male beds. Today we have seven male beds and three female beds at a new entry. Um, our work this year uh, for expansion includes uh, an increase um, in external referrals from hospital partners. We've already started that work with Del Seton, um, where we've added an RN uh, to help coordinate care and entry into the program. We are planning to expand our bed capacity with uh, hopefully an additional partner. And we're adding um, more time for the clinicians to see respite patients on site. Next slide. Oh, okay. Um, and so with the new entry being a recovery home, we have a few lessons that we've learned along the way. Um, and one of those things is that in that strict environment, a lot of our patients are not thriving. Um, so we are hoping to find um, a place with a less restrictive environment for those patients. And we've also learned that the respite needs extend beyond the MAP patients in this area. Um, and so we know that there's lots of growth opportunities. Next one. And I know this font is really small, so I won't bore you with the details, but um, we're currently in respite phase 2A. We are quickly moving into 2B, where we have um, our RN and medical assistant who will be able to, um, in the next few months, um, take vital signs and do the glucometer checks and things like that on site. Um, and then as we move into phase three, that's our bed expansion phase. Um, and then you'll see here, we're already calling attention to phase four, but that's as we are growing into FY24 um, into hopefully having our own medical respite facility. Next one. And so this is just a quick overview of where we are right now. We have um, 10 beds at a new entry. Again, that's seven male beds and three female beds. We have four dedicated beds at our residential rooming facility um, at Fresh Start but we have the capacity to expand up to four additional beds for females. Um, in those environments, um, each one of them is a, is a different setup. So you'll see where at a fresh start is more independent living, but the patients do have access to larger facilities um, and meals if needed. Um, but at a new entry, they have access to laundry and 24 hour staff. So as we're expanding, we're looking for those places that have that less restrictive environment. And the next one. All right, this is our last slide. Um, I just want to shout out Central Health. There are over 70, I think now 80 respite programs across the country. But I think the program that we have with Central Health is so unique because most programs are uh, paid for by hospitals and therefore take patients who are being discharged from the hospital. What's really unique about our program is because Central Health um, you know, has uh, overview of sort of our whole area, we can take patients from the hospital, we can take patients from nursing homes, we can take patients who are unsheltered. And as you can see, um, we don't want to wait till they get to the hospital, we want to prevent that. And so I think this is a very unique program, because we have the, that capability. Uh, we also have a very unique location. Most respite programs are located in shelters or hotel rooms. We have partnered with a new entry. So our patients who do have, who do suffer from substance use disorders can participate in some of the groups at respite. And it's almost like a two for one. They're healing, they're resting, and they're in an environment that will support their abstinence if that's what their, their goal is. 
Um, and then the last thing is that we um, really have some really unique resources. Many respite programs just start with a bed and they're there to heal and that's good. What we've been able to do is leverage our awesome medical management team so that while you're there, we already have a medical management team that knows how to help with benefits, um, help with housing, um, food, uh, uh, applications. And so I think that's a, a really beautiful thing that um, I wasn't expecting, but to see some of these outcomes that you saw, um, I just I really appreciate uh, this great team effort. And again, thank you to Central Health. Excellent presentation. And it is so refreshing to see that, you know, this is where medical miracles are made. All right, not so much in your high tech hospitals, not so much in, you know, ambulatory surgical centers. This is where medicine is truly working for the people who really need it and can't afford it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I was just listening to everyone's presentation. And I was thinking to myself, I might be a little biased, but <laughs> all the amazing work that my colleagues do to me feels like it's a facet of transitions of care. So I'm just really grateful for them. And I think our work overlaps on a daily basis. So we're excited to share a little bit about our department and what we're developing there. Um, but again, it really touches a lot of the other work that is happening at Central Health. So just wanted to highlight some objectives for our talk to give you all a little bit of a framework. Really wanna share the mission um, of our department since it is a new one and a novel one. And then talk through some of our programs that exist today and the updates that we have for them, specifically the post-acute program, which includes our skilled nursing facility program. And then we'll be talking about our transitions of care program as it pertains to the hospital and some of the work that we're doing there, both in the emergency department and in the inpatient setting for patients who get admitted to the hospitals. So this is a new department. It's one of very few in the country that exists. Um, so it's exciting. It's also great to be able to sit down and really think about what is our mission here and what are we aiming for? And in collaboration with our mission at Central Health, it's been really great to think about this in a framework of the triple aim and four pillars that come out of IHI or the Institute for Innovating Healthcare. So a lot of what we're trying to do in there, our aims and goals really circulate around these missions. So just to highlight those, the triple aim really focuses on the patient experience and making it patient-centered and thinking about how we advance that community health at a population health level and really thinking about health equity as well. But at the same time, understanding our resources and using them appropriately and to the best of our ways that we can for our patients. And then thinking about the four pillars, we kind of expand that model a little bit more to not only include patients, but their caregivers who are so instrumental in care for us and our patients and thinking about how do we educate them together, inform them together to make the right decisions with us and give them that opportunity to access their own health information, have access to the medical questions that come up around their medications and how to manage them. And then of course, getting them in the appropriate care in a timely fashion. So as we kind of think about everything that is being developed and exists today in transitions of care, we'd really like to give it this place flavor of work. And again, I wouldn't be anything without the team that works with me. So I wanted to give them a big shout out and highlight. Um, I won't go through everybody here, but just want to emphasize some of the players in our team. We have some amazing nurses and associate director who is a nurse by training, who has wonderful experience who has helped me develop a lot of these programs. Um, we have some new nurses that are starting in the hospital that you'll hear about a little bit later, and they're doing a lot of this transitions of care work to connect patients to care, address some of their health-related social needs in real time as well. And then the triad model that I've highlighted highlighted in the center of this screen, maybe um, familiar to a lot of you. It includes a nurse, a community health worker, and a social worker. So a traditional model, one that has a lot of great evidence behind it. And these, this triad exists for our patients who go to our skilled nursing facilities. They do an amazing job of following along in the medical care, but they also work to address a lot of those social needs that come up and really connect them to timely outpatient care, especially primary care and all the specialty care needs that they usually have. And then our last CHW, it's okay. 
Our last CHW is um, also going to be doing some amazing work in transitions of care and enrolling patients at a critical moment when they're in the hospital. So we'll talk some more about that later as well. So to start off and talk about our post-acute program, which is our skilled nursing facilities program, this existed prior to my time with Central Health, but it's been really exciting to see its growth and development. This slide demonstrates the average census of the skilled nursing facilities that are um, present for our patients with MAP. And as you can see, it's a pretty steady census during COVID. There were some challenges, but more recently, we've really tried to keep that census as high as we can. And we're really excited moving forward to continue to expand that census. To share a little bit about the demographics of our patients who are in skilled nursing facilities, that will be on the next slide. So this is just to give a highlight of some of the patients who are in our skilled nursing facility program. This is starting from the fiscal year in October. We do have a wide age range, but overall, if you compare to Medicare or Medicaid groups, our patients tend to be a little bit younger. Um, and looking at some of the other demographics, majority are English speaking, but we do have a mix there, same with race and ethnicity. And one of the interesting things that's not on this slide is up to 40% of our patients who are in the skilled nursing facility program are experiencing homelessness. And so having the respite program has been really huge. Um, traditionally, these patients would not have a safe disposition after leaving a skilled nursing facility. And it almost feels like you're just starting the cycle over again for their healing. And it's been really wonderful to be able to have a safer disposition, have them even more time or give them even more time to heal after their stay at the skilled nursing facility. Next slide, please. Now to talk a little bit about where we're headed in our post-acute program, which I'm really excited about. Um, we've thought a lot about how do we, you know, build more continuity there and elevate the quality of care. As many of you know, our hospitals are quite busy and crowded, and so more and more of our patients are at post-acute care facilities. One of the things that we have strategized is um, having central health providers take care of our patients in those facilities to give them that continuity of care and really connect them to care in many different ways. So we're excited to be um, doing this in this upcoming year. It'll be an attending physician and an APP model, and um, they will be responsible for the care of our patients who are in these facilities. And I'll have Dakasha share a little bit more about those goals. Um, so the goal of these, this program in particular um, will be to have um, a continuum of care from the SNFs and that bridge into, um, so once patients discharge from hospital, um, our team will be able to actually go into the SNFs and care for them um, and, the, and the more medically and socially complex patients. Um, and also another goal is to de decrease hospital readmissions um, and optimize medication management. Um, and this team, the SNF Direct Care, you could go to the next slide, will actually serve also as our care at home team. Um, and th that the purpose in that is to bridge um, a, the gap from when they discharge from SIFs to home to make sure that there's continuity of care there. Um, and the roadmap criteria for this program is uh, MAP and MAP basic um, patients, and they'll be identified um, patients. Um, with high-risk transitions from acute to post-acute care um, with any health-related social needs. Um, earlier, Dr. Patel mentioned the triad model. And so the triad will be um, going into the home along with the APP and the physicians to offer the uh, care in the home. Um, we're hoping to improve quality of care with overlapping teams to reduce readmissions again and to bridge patients between discharges and primary care. And then the next slide, another program that we are actually um, finishing up right now, um, the, the go live at least for this is the Hospital to SNF Warm Handoff. Um, and that is um, an evidence-based practice of communication basically, <laughs> um, ensuring that um, the hospital teams are communicating with the SNF teams regarding our patients uh, for better disposition. So this was a really exciting project for me because it sounds simple in theory as someone who used to work in the hospital and now works primarily in the clinic, um, but it's really hard to connect to people and providers in different spaces. You don't even use the same texting platform that's secure, so it creates a lot of barriers for patient care. Um, so we were really excited to get this going. We went live in October of last year, um, and we created this um, this 
tool that you see here to really make it very streamlined for our hospital and SNF partners to facilitate this transition. So we created the communication piece. We even implemented, you know, what is the key information that needs to be shared for a successful handoff? And after Go Live, we've been looking at our data, which is on the next slide. So mid-October was our implementation month, so the numbers were a little bit lower then. But if you look at the months afterwards and subsequently, red shows no handoff done, green shows handoff done. I know there is work to be done here, but as you all know, any change, especially a culture change, always takes time. Um, and we've been really excited this last month especially that February 100% is still 100%. I looked at it yesterday. Um, so it's really been exciting to, you know, reinforce this with our hospital partners and hear also the testimonials that we're getting from providers on both sides. They're just really grateful to have that communication channel opened up because otherwise it's a black hole to them what may have happened in the hospital if they don't have those records. So they're so thankful. They feel like they already know the patient before they come up to their door at the SNF and they just feel like they can provide even better quality care when they do arrive. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the transitions of care work that we're doing in the acute setting or the hospital setting. So um, we currently have a nurse who works in the Dell Seat Medical Center emergency room, and she's one person who mans this or is the workforce there in the emergency room. And I wanted to share a little bit of a snapshot of her data from the different quarters of last year. So as you can see, every quarter she sees about 400 patients, and that's a little over 100 patients every 30 days. Um, so you can do the math, how many patients that is a week. Um, she uh, really works in partnership with the medical team in the emergency room, but her role is to really um, connect with our patients, see what's going on with them, understand their needs, and then get them connected to outpatient care and make sure that's successful for them. So if they have transportation needs to get to their appointment, facilita facilitating that and really listening to them and um, building a plan that works for the patient as well. And then as we think about what our next steps are in the emergency room on the next slide, I think we're looking towards, you know, how do we um, expand this model to other emergency departments? And then we're also really excited about a different phase of our work. Um, it's called the Most Visited Patients Program, and I can't take credit for this amazing name, um, but it's called the MVP program. And the idea is to really collaborate with partners in the hospital in the emergency room to identify those patients that may be returning to the emergency room and understand the why behind that and really address it. So this is a program that's still in development and in process. We're currently working on a proposal with our partners at the hospital, but we're really excited to get this off the ground. And I think it's wonderful that we're collaborating to do this work because that's really the only way to make it sustainable. Next slide, please. Now I wanna shift a little bit more to talk about our nurses that are gonna be on the floors for patients who are admitted to the hospital. Really exciting, our, our first nurse that we hired for this endeavor actually started this last Monday at Del Seton. So um, this is built on kind of a mix of all of the best of these three programs that you see on this slide here. Um, Society of Hospital Medicine created a project boost program for transitions of care. There's a care transitions program that has gotten a lot of um, traction at the national level that was still developed at the University of Colorado in Denver. And then the last one is the transitional care model that was developed outside of the University of Pennsylvania. So um, this program is really going to be focusing on patients who are already admitted to the hospital, but are at a critical point. And that critical point is that time of discharge and understanding, you know, how can we facilitate that even further and make it smooth? Because I think as many of us understand that time period between discharge from the hospital to that first appointment follow-up, nobody really knows what's going on. And patients definitely don't have a way of making sure they're doing the right thing, or if they need help, how do they ask for that help? So this is a program that we created for that space and to kind of fill that space. So the nurse is set to visit with the patient before they even discharge, do an assessment, understand their health literacy and their understanding of their health care, and also understand um, what they understand about their outpatient and follow-up plan. And then the beautiful thing is, their nurse will actually be calling them 72 hours later to check in on them and make sure they're doing well. 
make sure they have their medications, make sure they still have a great plan in place to follow up with their providers. Next slide, please. So this is a really busy slide. I don't intend to read all of this or go over it with you. The only reason I'm sharing it here is because I just want to demonstrate that these programs, although Transitions of Care is somewhat novel to us in this country, um, there are a lot of great programs that have been developed across the country looking at it, and there's a lot of great evidence there. So, you know, I'm a big believer in not trying to reinvent the wheel, but just really optimizing the things that we know about. And so when we built this program, we really put together the best of each of these programs and really highlighted those things in that left-hand column that really make the patient experience better. So in summary, on the next slide, I know we covered a lot of different things, but I'm very excited about, you know, what's happening today in transitions of care and where we're headed. Um, whether it's um, development of our direct care in the SNFs, whether it's the parallel program with care at home. I didn't get to emphasize that slide that you saw or that graph that you saw in the care at home slide, but the United States uh, providers in this country, only 37% of them report um, doing visits at home, which is an appallingly low number. And if you look back at that graph, you'll see other countries that we compare to economically, numbers are like in the 80s. So I'm especially excited about the Care at Home program because I think it'll be an opportunity for us to really delve into that space, along with all the other great things that we're working on. So. That is in totality what we're working on. We thank you very much for your time. Excellent. Continuity of care is just so important. Yes. Congratulations, Dr. Patel, on all of your accolades. I've, I've read them in the numerous newsletters that have had your pictures and everything. Great job. Thank, thank you. you. I appreciate it. All right. And so last, I'll be talking to you about um, substance use disorders. Uh, treatments that we have going on in Central Health. Um, in 2019, some of you may remember that we um, began our partnership with um, community care and integral care for our medication assisted treatment program, also known as the MAT program. Um, last year in May, the Travis County Commissioner's Court actually um, considered the opioid overdose as a public health crisis. And as our response to that, we um, partnered with Community Medical Services, also known as CMS, for uh, methadone treatments for MAP patients in this area. Um, and then later, uh, last year, November, we actually expanded services to um, addiction and psychotherapy services. Um, some of you may know it as Austin Methadone or Oshbach and Associates um, for additional methadone access for our patients. And we are continuing to expand. Um, our network in substance use disorders. And that concludes everything, I think, for the evening. Dr. Bell, if I may, I uh, sure. just really want to thank our presenters and our team and thank you, board, for the opportunity to come present and introduce some of our team members and uh, really highlight uh, just a few of the programs that have uh, been up and running. There's a lot of pieces that have to come together uh, for these programs to run, and our teams have really uh, hit the ground running here over the past year and made a lot of progress. So uh, these are multi-year builds, so I think what you're seeing is just the start, um, and really look forward to coming back and, and sharing progress uh, periodically for you all. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Brian, uh, can you and Dr. Shalsha, can you guys take some questions or comments? They are I will hand off the microphone as questions. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to go around the room and just let everybody sort of comment. So I'll start with I'll start with <laughs> Manager Martin. So first of all, thanks. It's great work and how hard it is. I really do. I did emergency medicine for a long time, and it's um a difficult situation where you're all handling. I do have several medical questions related first, and I will, I'm not going to hold all of them. We can rotate, but in concerning dialysis, um, do all your patients end up transition to a separate care program, say Medicaid or some support service available, say that's not Medicaid? I mean, because dialysis by definition is disability. 
Right. Yeah. So I think uh, excellent question. So I think as a uh, as we showed uh, throughout this transition period, all of our patients that we had enrolled into our program, every patient was able to transition to an alternate payer. So um, now, as you can imagine, throughout the year, we may have patients and throw to Medicare, Medicaid, uh, others may have to wait until the open enrollment. But at the end of our day, the, the goal is to uh, transition every single patient to an alternate payer. So. Okay. Uh, also, um, because of the access, vascular access, I know this isn't a condition that for say the homeless people, for example, but people who uh, are moving to more stable situations or live in a more stable situation, are y'all considering peritoneal dialysis instead of hemodialysis, which is a lot cheaper to do and um, a lot less user um, intensive? Yeah, that's actually one of the um, one of the the treatments that's that's available to the patients if they don't want to go into the clinic to receive dialysis, they can also have the option to receive dialysis at home or receive peritoneal. Um, Dialysis, yes. At home. Are, yeah. are y'all pushing one way or the other? I mean, we educate the patient on these options when we enroll them into the program. And then we um, we allow the clinic to um, to further educate the patient. And if the patient chooses to go one way or the other, then the clinic will set that up. Okay. I did have one question for Dr. I'm sorry they left. And that is um, our vascular services involved, uh, interventional radiology? Uh, or cardiology for salvage of limbs, for example, for stenting and a great question, Amaya. Uh, great question. Uh, one of the one of the reasons that we're so excited uh, related to our podiatric program is prior to doctors Nielsen and Calipac being here, um, if our patients had a below the knee amputation, a hundred percent of them were non-ambulatory. And so we have actually partnered with um, our Ascension partners, um, work with vascular very closely. Um, we are in the process of um, working up a limb salvage program that actually Ascension is leading within that environment. Um, and um, I think we're exploring what that means because right now we're working in the ambulatory care setting. And so our podiatrists have been working historically off of these wait lists um, that have been, you know, pretty, uh, pretty significant in nature. Um, how can we get ahead of this and proactively, you know, work with patients who come into the ED and care for them acutely? So um, we're looking uh, both to work with cardiology, to increase our work with vascular, um, and then really wrap that care team. And is hyperbaric oxygen uh involved at all? It has not been to date. Okay. And I have one last question, transitions to care. Since I did ER for so long, I think it's great y'all put a nurse into the emergency room and whatnot, and you say you're going to expand it. Now, if a patient comes in at one in the morning with whatever, whatever, the nurse is not going to be there. Is a system going to be set in place to sort of, we identified these patients when I was at Brackenridge to sort of capture them, to set up and say, here's this patient every 10 times, this, the nurse will be contacted in the morning to reach out to this person. Is that the plan to expand it to the emergency rooms as well, not just Del Seton? That's a great question. Yes, that's one of the things we looked at. So right now the nurse that's in the emergency room, she does some of this work on those days where she may not be there. And she looks at the daily census that we receive. Um, so she tries to reach them via phone if she can. Um, and then the same thing came up for our patients who are admitted to the hospital and the nurse that may miss them as well. Um, they will be looking at the census as well and making sure to try to make connections to those patients that perhaps may have discharged after hours or on Sunday or Saturday, something of that sort. And that's where that MVP program really comes into place that I, I talked about real briefly. Um, those patients that you're talking about that may be coming and returning to the emergency room um, where we do get a lot of that information now. So we're just trying to streamline how do we utilize that information to really provide the best care for those patients and connect to them in a meaningful way, like you're saying. Thank you. Y'all are doing great work, really. Thank you. It's phenomenal. Thank you, Manager Martin. Manager Jones. I'd just like to echo what Manager Martin just said. Um, the great work you're doing, very impressed and very important. Um, where is the respite center located? Where at General Leon? I don't know what part of town that's in. East Central? No. Oh. <laughs> I did a map on one of the 
Yeah, okay. the reason I ask is because uh, is there do you have a concern because depending on where where we will roll, there are other uh, public health issues that are just over there. And I didn't know if you all have problems with some of the clients uh, or some of the uh, citizens in those areas interacting with those and causing any challenges for you. That's the first question I have. Uh, that's a great point. Uh, I, I think some of the challenges that come up and probably would occur in any location is just access to um, substances or uh, other things that they might that might deter their their goals um, and the program. Um, and so I, at this point, this the location itself hasn't uh, that specific location hasn't caused those problems. But we do, you know, always consider like where they're located and, and what their access. Um, to other things might be. Uh, uh, my last question is whether or not, uh, do you in interact or engage obviously with AP, uh, uh, Public Health in terms of some of the outreach services you do and connectivity there? Our um, Healthcare for the Homeless team, uh, not so much. Um, I think there are some um, citywide um, initiatives that come up where we will partner. There's something called the the pop-up resource centers that are the third Wednesday of every month that's uh, hosted by EMS. And so we participate there and a lot of the different agencies come and bring their services. Um, that's the main one I can think of. Thanks very much for your work. You're really to be commended. Thank you, Manager Jones. Manager Zamora. Chair, no questions as usual. Just a statement. Great. I know this board is very proud of all the providers that work with the care. But we have to be extra proud of Dr. Pond, who this last last November won a humanitarian award from the Travis County Medical Society. Wow. And I'm just humble to tell you that. And our chair, I mean our CMO over there, won the award in 2019 for that for all of his work. Our providers do fantastic work. Our medical society watches them. <laughs> they're they're extremely proud of them as well. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kwan and Dr. Shawson. Uh, Dr. David Clark who works for Dim Pound. Does Dr. David Clark work for Dim Pound? Yes, Dr. Also, also won the humanitarian award. And then remind me of the young man who won the young physicians award back in twenty. Thank you, Goda. Was now previously? Yeah, yeah. now CMO. Now uh, CMO. Yeah, thank you, Goda. So. Our providers are doing this kind of work at, at Central Health that everybody's watching. They're, they're, they're extremely proud of it. Dr. Juan, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Zamora, for bringing that to our attention. Uh, we're very, very proud of our providers and all of the work that all of the staff have done. Manager Ms. Yeah. Um Thank you for that phenomenal presentation. I almost, I was literally tearing. <laughs> the stories are very impactful. Um, thank you for, uh, for changing lives, all of you all. Um, I, um, one thing that I caught my attention, also a lot of things. Uh, now, giving the respite here, the top diagnosis that you have, the second is cancer. And now as I'm thinking about all these comorbidities around these specific patients, the podiatry and um, renal disease, are you following up with your survivors and those who really need um, special attention and care beyond primary care and um, especially for our specific, uh, specific population? So I'm just curious if you have a method, what are you, for, are you um, how are you following up? With those specific patients who really need special attention, given that that's one of the top diagnoses, and um, with everything else they have. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think one of the things that drew me to um, medical respite was I previously worked in the hospital and just saw the revolving door. Um, and what I love about respite is it just gives a chance for a person to um, start to think about their health instead of thinking about how to survive from day to day. Um, and so um, when they come to respite, um, one of the biggest things is coordinating their care, getting them to their specialist appointment. And, you know, they're 
they're still in a tizzy from being in the hospital and they've gotten all this paperwork. And so, you know, having someone there to help them set up their appointments, get to their appointments, and then maintain that um, is really great. And most uh, most of them will come and follow me as a community care physician um, on the other side. So I get to be part of their care. And, um, and then we get to refer them to their cardiologist, set them up for studies, get them their mammograms and things that they probably fell by the wayside. Um, so the care continues. And what's really neat too is some of the patients that have left respite, um, they still have our social worker's phone number. So even though they might have gotten asked to leave or they left on their own, um, we get phone calls two months later saying, hey, can we come back? Um, and so we don't, the goal is, it, what's really neat is once they know who we are, um, we want to continue to take care of them um, and engage them. Um, and, and they may not be ready and not, not all of them are, but they know who we are and they can come back and, and, uh, and continue to get care. Well, thank you so much. And as you mentioned, I love that you're, Quote, all star wow star team <laughs> and you have wowed us this evening and thank you for everything that you are doing for our community thank you uh manager Clinton. well i just wanted to ask on substance use disorder uh, treatment i i um forgive me if i misgot this but uh i know that you are trying to get the patients in for methadone and and so after that step, does it continue, their care continue in the substance use disorder, or do you then leave that care to the physician at the methadone clinic? The care is already up to the physician at the methadone clinic. We've um, set up a relationship with the B team at the hospital, um, of course, with our MAT partners. So everyone is aware that we have um, access for methadone. And so they're referring patients in to uh, CMS and addiction and psychotherapy. And once they're in, they're under the management of those physicians. And what about buprenorphine? Buprenorphine is given through our MAT program. So at Community Care, uh, we have a program and we're in the process of restarting our program with integral care. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. Sorry, can I add just a tiny, tiny bit more? Um, great, great question. And uh, I think the one of the aspects of individuals who have an addiction disorder is really keeping them in care. So that is central to the direction of those individuals' care. I think there are different programs um, for different individuals, and some individuals actually transition from methadone to Suboxone and back again. Um, if the patient is cared for within community care, um, there is a, a there are a couple central teams, kind of a hub and spoke model. And once individuals are stabilized, they then are transitioned into kind of that spoke model where it is just a part of the routine care um, with uh, with some of our um, addiction teammates and some of you know our partnerships, they actually have a wrapped environment to where it's not just addiction disorder that's taken care of. There are peer, peer recovery um, and a, a bunch of other collaborative um, methodologies that are utilized to take care of those patients. So the goal is really to keep them in care and wrap that care. Thank you. Thank you. Manager Valadez. Uh, I wish you all had existed uh, before my late night session. Uh, but, uh, and then I would have had him in your program. Uh, we were divorced, but he was a bad diabetic. And one of the things that highlighted the vacuums is the transitions from getting into the hospital. And then I know, I think I knew every sniff in town. Dr. Somewhat had the, had the house of London doing how well, he, if it was one thing, it was another, and then it killed him. Um, regardless, uh, one of the big problems that I, I uh, noticed, uh, aside from the mental health issue, I mean, the, the mental health issue, the component with depression or getting his, a, a, a toe amputated, then a foot amputated, then there goes his leg. And uh, he was at Ascension. He was started out at St. David's, ended up at Seton. And no one hospital had a, a counseling or psychiatric component to provide any help or any assistance to the patient or the patient's family as to how they were going to deal with that amputation. amputation. It, it didn't make a difference how 
how educated you were. He was a lawyer. He woke up the next morning after his, they didn't tell him he was going to be a possible amputee. They took off his leg. He's screaming in the hospital room as a family member, you know, and I'm begging for them to provide psychiatric uh, counseling for him so he can adjust and then teach us what we need to do at home. But that, that's history. I have to thank Mike and I have to thank Jonathan and I have to thank the Center Health uh, Board for having, after I spoke, <laughs> I'm dealing with a lot of stuff at the time uh, for approving the extension of services into this arena. And that's, I just have to tell you, I can see still some gaps. Uh, I don't know if that psychiatric or counseling component is something that you have considered uh, to maintain uh, and expand upon because I know in the hospitals, it still doesn't. Uh, there is no component for that. And then um, after that, transitioning it to home, he was living alone. So I was going back and forth and back and forth. And you know, for those of you that know, I have a daughter who's now bedridden, but medically complex. And it became very difficult. Um, I'm telling you, he was a bad diabetic, <laughs> bad end stage renal failure, bad everything. Um, but the education component and the training component and the follow-up, you know, uh, for the, the transition team to at home or out of that setting, it, to me, it's, it's not just a homeless because he was homeless for all intents and purposes. Yes, he's in his house, but he couldn't go to his house because there was nobody to care for him at the house. Uh, so he was in, kept transitioning to these settings and I'm the one that ultimately got him on long-term Medicaid. Um, so just that, that I want to, do keep that in, in consideration of expanding uh, for that transition to the family and patient. With respect to the opioid uh, and substance abuse, uh, abuse issue, I've noticed that there are some new programs that are going to address high school students who many are em emancipated, graduating or dropping out of school. They're in the streets and they're dying. And so one of the options that I wanted to know is whether or not y'all, Alan, uh, have considered working with the school systems within Travis County so that the nurses would be able to have the ability to emer emergency manage something that may occur at, at, at on campus or whatever because they're, they, they may end up being non, they're homeless or they're non uh, uh, emancipated or they're no insurance and not a good family situation because it's a very difficult, the mental health component, the psychological impact on a family is very difficult to address or people to admit to. Okay, that's the hard issue. And so I was wondering whether or not we are considering working with the school districts in the development of that, an expansion of that kind of a program, because this, it, we get it from zero to the grave. And so unless you have that, if we're, unless we are following, with those entities that are addressing our pop, pop future or existing populations, we're not going to catch them. And uh, we may catch some, but what we're looking for is the manipulation of a process that will close all the gaps. We won't have to be talking about disparities anymore. So now uh, I'm wondering to know. Manager Valadez, uh, very sorry to hear about your ex-husband's Jonathan, you knew it back at the time. Well, I don't think I know all those details, but th oh, thank, thank you for sharing stories. Yeah, it, those are the types of cases that we hope to affect. So um, to answer, I think, your, your first question about psychiatric and counseling services, um, it couldn't have been a better preview for, I think, some of our upcoming budget requests. Yes. I mentioned earlier that this is a progressive bill. Um, and I think we've all certainly recognized the need to have integrated behavioral health, both counseling and psychiatric access as we build all of these programs. So uh, I think that also extends to a, a virtual care program as well so that we can get that psychiatric access available uh, to our you know, care at home team members and into, into the different facilities where our patients are. So that is absolutely part of the plans and we'll be coming back to talk in more detail about that. Um, you mentioned um, enrollment earlier. I think that's another uh, very important piece, whether it's getting our patients transitioned to a 
uh, a more permanent dialysis program based on their disability, um, whether it's enrolling patients into uh, Sendero and those appropriate cases. Enrollment and eligibility really is the front door for many of our patients to access services. And, um, it's another key component. So uh, as we're looking at social needs, getting people enrolled and keeping them enrolled is a, is a critical aspect of that. Um, absolutely, there will be more opportunities to work with schools. I think one of our early lessons learned with the MAT program um, was it initially was not open to adolescents, and it is now um, for exactly the problem that you're discussing. I, I, I'm not prepared to go into a lot of detail tonight on um, other opportunities with the school districts, but I do think those are those are coming in, in future conversations. I appreciate that, Jonathan. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, John. And thank you all for doing the great work that you're doing. So thank that you, other families have to go. Appreciate it. What we do. Manager Mathwani. Uh, I don't think I have much more to add, except uh, I just wish that every investing stakeholder, uh, you know, in the county uh, and beyond could see this presentation because it redoubles my faith that this organization, this executive team, this our CMO, this provider team uh, can assess need, can develop strategy, can stand up services and do it successfully through the lens of best practice. I mean, through the lens of, you know, frankly, humanitarianism, moral compulsion, uh, and, you know, even economic pragmatism, uh, for that matter. Um, and uh, I, I just, it just really re strengthens my faith that we, we can execute on this, uh, on our, on our strategic health equity plan. Uh, and to me, it's a down payment, if you will, on the ROI uh of of what we're expecting uh from the execution of that plan and uh yeah trust is earned and i and i feel like um we're earning it and it's this is a really 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 big deal and i and i just i deeply appreciate it thanks thank you manager montwani manager kitchen well yes i i, I echo what everyone has uh, i think you know it's 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 a kind of really I'm sorry. How do I do that? Uh, okay. All right. So I was just going to say, I do think it would be helpful to take this to the public health committee at the uh, city of Austin. A very good way for them to really get in their heads what central health is doing. Um, I just have um, two quick questions. One has to do with the transition of care program. Um, and just, just remind me, um, where is this occurring now? Is it at Bell or? The, um, the nurses that are in the hospitals evaluating patients that are admitted specifically. Yeah, we right. hospital. Yes, um, so they're at Dell Seton and our goal is to um, mobilize them over Seton, Maine and continue to expand afterwards as well. Okay, okay. Um, and I'm, cu Manager, I'm curious. You, uh, I just wanted to add uh, to Dr. Patel's uh, comment, you know, I think our, our end goal is the four facilities that our patients are in most frequently. Okay. So Del Seton, uh, Seton Medical Center, Austin, and then two St. David's facilities as well are our targets and we're actively pursuing that. Okay. Uh, I would imagine that, um, that you are, you will be able to, if you haven't yet, be able to, um, collect data related to people who don't have a home to be transitioned to mm -hmm. uh, because I'd really like to understand better. I don't, I, I, I doubt that there's a place to discharge them to always. Right. And, um, and so I would love, I would like to know what's happening with those folks and the, de the degree to which they may be discharged back to the streets. Yes. I'm talking about folks that don't fit for the respite program or, or there's no beds in the respite program. Yes. So I think it would be good for, uh, I think this is a, the reason I'm mentioning it, it is something that the whole community should take some responsibility for. I don't think it's central health uh, responsibility alone. And I think shining a light on that is important. So, um, so collecting that data, we can talk. We can talk about how to shine a light on it later. But I think collecting that data is really important. Yes. So, 
couldn't agree with you more. Um, that is definitely one of the things that we are looking at. Okay. Along with um, other pieces of utilization data and then follow up success rate as well. Okay. Okay. Um, then the second thing would just be, um, uh, let's see, related to, to, to respite. Um, I'm very, um, well, I'm excited about all of these programs. I mean, you're, you guys are really, you're just right on target for things that need to be, to be addressed. Um, and what I'm, what I'm thinking about here is a phase five, maybe. My guess is that you don't have a, a set, you don't have, I don't have vouchers, right? And you probably don't have uh, beds or rooms or apartments de designated for people out of respite, right? Okay, uh, let's think about that. That might be a phase five, you know, because I think that what would be great is to get to a point, and again, this is not something central health can solve, it's a community problem, but get to a point where someone you know that once they're they're in respite, you know that as long as they're, you know there's a place for them. We we know they have to accept it and they have to be ready for it and that kind of thing, but but there should be a place for them. So yeah, yes, I absolutely agree. Um, I've been having conversations with Echo Good. because in other parts of the country, respite is part of the um, care continuum yeah. or according to entry, yeah. and it is the same population um, that should be getting housed. Um, and I've been able to show some data that a lot of our respite patients won't get housed through the current system because their CA score isn't high enough. Yeah, they don't. Yeah, they and don't. so um, in the program that I used to work in, um, the county used to give our respite program 40 vouchers off the bat every year just to have. And yeah. I think that was awesome. Um, no, so yeah. I the, the, the coordinated assessment program is there yeah, for a reason, sure. but there's so many holes in it. And this is one of them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. We appreciate the presentation. It was awesome. Okay. Managers, we will go on to item number, agenda item number two. Receive a progress update on the operational and financial sustainability planning, uh, OFSP, including a preview of approach and prioritization methodology overview. Monica Crowley and Dr. Abhi Sharma and Julia Clark will be presenting. I'm going to let Abhi and Julia, Julia uh, take the same thing. Here's some of the microphones. Slide. Perfect. Thank you. Appreciate it. Can y'all hear me okay? Yes, I can. A little bit louder if you... Is this better? Yeah. Okay. So we wanted to provide a, an update. I know that, that we've been providing monthly updates to you all. We've made some great progress since, since last month, so we're grateful for your time tonight and excited to share with you where we are. So we'll spend a little bit of time um, talking about the overview of that first phase of work in this in this body of work. Um, we're coming to a close on phase one and beginning phase two, so wanted to provide a comprehensive update of what was accomplished in, in phase one. Um, we'll talk about the, the major achievements, and then we'll walk through a little bit of the developed initiatives to address the community needs. So we've had the good opportunity of sharing with you all the community needs assessment previously, what we're going to do to combat um, um, the community needs. And we've spent a lot of time developing and prioritizing initiatives, so we'll talk about that today. 
And we'll talk about the prioritization methodology. So there's a, a, a robust methodology behind the way that we prioritize each of our initiatives. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like. And then we'll preview the depth of initiatives and then some high level estimated investments and then spend a little time talking through next steps. And then of course, uh, taking all of your questions. Go to the next slide. Thank you. So this slide probably looks familiar. I know you all have seen it quite a few times. The, the beginning part on the left-hand side was the healthcare equity plan, which you're all familiar with. The blue side is the OFSP, so the, the project that we're working on currently. Um, we are at the end of phase one, which is where that little red star is, which means that we've defined and prioritized all of the key initiatives for addressing the community needs. Um, and after that, we'll conduct a, a robust capabilities and operational assessment on those prioritized initiatives and then design the operational and financial plans. Um, so taking a look at what we've completed since we last spoke, we've had weekly working sessions and update meetings with leadership. Um, and, and while those look like simple meetings, those are really robust working sessions where we have the opportunity to meet with your subject matter experts. A lot of the folks that you heard from tonight really roll up our sleeves and together look at both quantitative and qualitative data to inform all of our decision making and make those decisions together. And so using that data driven approach, we've been able to address the critical community needs and identify short, medium and long term initiatives. We've also been able to conduct strategic visioning sessions. So taking all of the things that we've learned together with the qualitative data, the quantitative data, a lot of the conversations that we've had with with you all and with your teams. And then validate the initiatives that we'll talk about today and then prioritize those initiatives based on that methodology that I referred to earlier that we'll talk about in one of the next slides. Thank you. So just a, a reminder of where we are with the community needs. Under each of these initiative categories, together we've developed initiatives to address each of the community needs. So what you'll see across the top is those key community needs that we've discussed previously, that we know that this community really needs. We've seen the great work that folks are doing in the community to start meeting these needs. Um, and within each of these key domains, so across primary care, specialty, including behavioral and dental, and then everything from the hospital to the post-acute setting, um, and then key enablers, so key items that we'll need to make sure all of the things on the left-hand side can run successfully. So things like care coordination, pharmacy, eligibility and enrollment, interoperability, technology to support all of that. And then of course, not forgetting uh, social determinants of health and coverage programs, because without both of those being acknowledged, we of course can't be successful in the, in the first three columns. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the initiatives that lie in each of those categories, which will include some healthcare for the homeless, have you, as you've heard a little bit about today, expanded access to same day care, extended hours, and including some virtual options. And then we'll also talk a little bit about expanding access to primary care, as well as expanded access to specialty care, hear a little bit more on substance use disorders and access to mental health services, which I know is a key priority for this group as well. Um, and then dental care, and then in the third column here, we'll talk about the robust uh, post-acute care, including respite and extensivists, how that was prioritized and what we're looking at there, expanded access to surgical and procedural care, and expanded access to hospital care. And then again, the two items on the left, the foundational enablers and social determinants and coverage programs, of course, underscore and make sure that these three on the left are successful. You can go ahead and advance the next slide. Thank you. So as I mentioned previously, um, we have a methodology that we use when we're thinking about prioritizing initiatives for a community. So together, we went through a very robust data-driven prioritization exercise to identify priority level for each initiative. And for each initiative under those stacks, there were dozens. So lots and lots of initiatives looked at all at once. Um, and we put them into four categories. So the categories that we, we put them through, and, and Dr. Sharma will talk a little bit more about this in a moment and then walk through the prioritization grid itself. Um, but as we think about all of those initiative categories and every single initiative that falls under them, we put them into categories based on level of impact. So how impactful with, will this be to our community? 
and level of effort. What are the dependencies that will actually make this successful? Is this something that we can do pretty quickly and pretty seamlessly, or is this something that's going to take many, many years and lots of participation from stakeholders? And based on those, as well as a number of other um, variables, we pop them into these categories, tiers one through four. Tier one is your imperatives. So in that top right column, those are going to be our most urgent, high priority, important initiatives that we know will have execution risk, meaning they might be a little bit more difficult to do. They might rely on partner dependency a lot, um, but we know that they're incredibly important for the community. So it's something that we're going to push forward. Then we have tier two, which is quick wins. These are initiatives that have a, a, a high level of impact and are a little bit less difficult to execute. So we might be able to do them more quickly and start to get to impact faster. And then we have tier three, which is future priorities, which it, in essence are, are things that might possibly be prioritized in the future. They still have a lot of value. We could probably still do them relatively seamlessly, but given the imperatives and the quick wins that we have on our plate, they aren't the first thing that we're gonna go after. So they belong in kind of more of a parking lot list. And then finally, we have the fourth tier, which is a recalibration tier. And this really means we need to take a look at after we've accomplished and, and put forth the plans for tiers one and tier two, we've thought a little bit about tier three. Do these uh, do these items really need to be delivered now? Um, are they required to make the other initiatives impactful? And if not, we can back burner those for the time being. So looking at the, the next slide, I'm gonna let Dr. Sharma kind of talk you through um, the spread here and what that really means, but. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Julia. So like Julia mentioned, we've been working closely with the central health leadership team as well as subject matter experts to dive deeper into the initiatives to essentially assess two things. The first one is given the nature and scope of an initiative, what is the level of impact that an initiative would have on closing current community needs? And what we are looking specifically at here is the delta between what things are now and what things would be if this initiative were to be executed. The second thing that we are also looking at is the level of effort that it would take for these initiatives to be executed. So a level of effort includes things like the operational infrastructure that would be required to stand an initiative up, the dependence on partners, the fiscal need for an initiative to be run. So those kind of things are allowing us to gauge at a high level what the level of effort for each of these initiatives would be. So the reason we wanted to share this slide was to just show the scale of initiatives and the number of initiatives that we need to work on to meet the community's expectations and needs. We counted these and there are 158 individual standalone initiatives that are on this chart. What we also wanted to show here was that if you look at the four quadrants, there are a ton of initiatives that are extremely important for us to focus on, but the spread of initiatives across these four quadrants is almost equally proportional. So visually, each of these quadrants has equal number of initiatives with slight differences between uh, the recalibrate ones and the others. Now, what I want us to focus on here is the fact that this is a comparative assessment. It's not absolute. It does not mean that the initiatives that are in the recalibrate quadrant or in the future priorities quadrant are not important. What this simply means is there are bigger and more impactful initiatives for us to focus on before we move into those quadrants. So it's comparative. And we need to think about the fact that there are 159 initiatives here all of which would require substance, substantive fiscal grit. And we need to be extremely careful about what those trade-offs are. Uh, next slide, please. So like I, like I mentioned, we tried to gauge what the level of effort here would be. And one of the things that makes that up is the funding that would be required to stand these initiatives up and then to sustain these initiatives over a long period of time. Now, what I want you to focus on are the figures that are at the bottom most row. And these are approximations. 
based on the number of patients that would be impacted by the needs and how that translates into number of visits and then to the number of physicians and the physical infrastructure that we require to stand each of these initiatives up. Now, the bottom number for just the short-term initiatives is from 100 million to 220 million. If you move towards the right, medium-term initiatives, again, 100 to 200. And long-term initiatives would range from, again, more than 200, because one of the things that we will focus on here would be to keeping the initiatives that have been set up in the short and long-term sustainable, as well as adding new capabilities. So this is a lot of money. And if you compare that to the fact that there are a ton of initiatives that need to be prioritized, we'll have to make trade-offs based on where we can drive the most value and impact our patients the most. If you were to look at the different care categories, there is significant difference between where we would require the most funding. As an example, the specialty and behavioral health bucket is one of the biggest drivers of cost, which is again, driven by the fact that clinicians would be needed, physical infrastructure would be needed to, would be needed in order to execute on these initiatives. And then one of the biggest variables that we are working on right now is the need for a hospital in the future. And that is also going to account for the cost that we would have to allocate just to stand these initiatives up and then to run these initiatives. I'll take a pause there because I know I, this is really important um, content. So any, any questions? I have a lot um, of questions. Yes. Well, and, and, <laughs> and uh, also, let's, let's try to be cognizant of time. Um, I'll start off because I do have a question in the fact that when you look at these numbers, especially on the short term column, does that encompass the, um, what do you call the imperatives and the quick wins, or that, does that encompass all four tiers when you look at that money? That's across all four tiers because each initiative category has short, medium, and long-term initiatives within them. And some of those might not be priorities. They may end up being deprioritized. So those are not the total values for that those two right quadrants that you're thinking about. Okay. Yeah, good uh, question. So. All right, uh, I'm easiest for me to just go around the table. So you didn't want me to start there. I'm gonna start with you this time. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, Members, if you're formulating your question, you're, you're going to see this information again several times over in leading up to the budget session. But if you can offer some guidance the next time we do come okay. before you, what other questions do you have? Thank you, Mr. Deason. I really appreciate that. Manager Kitchen. Okay, so, so one question is a process question then. Um, I would like to see the the list of 158 initiatives. 59, 59 sorry. <laughs> and uh, I would like to understand where, I, well, first off, let me just say thank you. I, I think that, I, I think the the way you, the, the, the prioritization makes sense to me. Okay. But I would like to see what each one of these little triangles are. Yes. And so, my process question is when and how do we get to see that? And also, I assume that there's an approval process for that. Yeah, there is. And so there's two things that are happening in the background. One, like Dr. Sharma said, we kind of put everything on the map that is a possibility. And then we spend time deciding what really makes the most sense based on the evidence that we're finding in terms of financial viability, needs of the patient population. Those that we push forward then become conversation, approval, et cetera, with this group. That said, I don't think there's any reason we can't share the I, 148. I, yeah, I would like to see them all. Yeah, so, <laughs> understandably. Because I would, I, just because I want to understand what the thinking is, because mm -hmm. I, I can understand it in abstract as sure. you explain it. Sure. Mm -hmm. But unless I see an initiative, and I don't want an initiative to fall off the list without understanding that it was there and it fell off. Got it. Absolutely. And why? Absolutely. Okay. Got it. And then, um, and then the second question is just, uh, uh, I think with that, On the grid, it, well, on the grid itself, the similar to your question, on the grid itself, how do you account for, or how do you 
how does it fit in prioritization a project that may be impacting a small number of people at very high need? Yep. So that's why we focus on the degree of change versus what the initiative would actually culminate with. So it's essentially if in your example, there is an initiative where it's impacting a very small population, the need is high, and none of that need is being met, that will obviously be prioritized. Okay, so degree of change doesn't necessarily mean it's not measured solely by the number of people in there. No, no. Okay. Okay. Manager Martin, I was going. <laughs> <laughs> so I did hear it, but I didn't follow the question. So. Oh, I was. Do you have any questions? I don't. Actually, you don't. No, okay. You. No problem. Uh, Manager Lakwani. No. Manager Jones. Manager Dalton. Um. So this is supposed to be research based. So with that in mind, you know the understanding of the population, the, the community medical needs, you know where they're located, and also the demographic report have got to be the basis of, of uh, prioritization and significant threat in development or whatever, including strat especially strategies depending on the populations that we're addressing. And I have some concerns, in my opinion, serious concerns, but not, maybe not anybody else's, about the demographic report. And so I would like for someone to explain to me, and not necessarily here, but if they could call me and talk to me and maybe set up a meeting or something, to talk about um, how the demographic report is based on standard uh, universally accepted uh, research based guidelines. And uh, because I want to make sure that no one in the community can come back and sit there and say that was allowed to demographic report. We don't take compare as I, as I, I didn't mention uh, uh, race population and then compare it to. A geographically located population. So you don't do that. It doesn't make any sense. So taking the scripted for this particular category is what I would like to have. So in the meeting, if I to the for asking, I'm not going to have to be in the with them. But I'm not going to. Ask y'all to answer or respond to that here. I just would like to have the opportunity to speak with someone and have them explain it to me, unless there's somebody else that needs that. So that's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Yes. And so, uh, if, if, if I may, Guidehouse, um, you know, they've seen the demographic report, but they didn't do the demographic report. That was an internal staff exercise. And so we can certainly come back and, and talk about it. But um, if I could. Get the get the question narrowed down a little bit. Is it this being an evidence based study? Did, how did it take into and, and I realize there's some issues with the demographic report that, that we central health staff can bring back to you. But how does this work in the prior health equity study that was done that's the basis for this work come together with the demographic? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, and that's something that we can come back and that's, speak that's to right. more, thank perhaps you. qualitatively and quantitatively. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Keeson. Uh, Manager Moore. Manager Brinson. Yep. Manager McTighty. I asked my question. I just want to make sure that um, this uh, this is referencing to the first which contract. No, it's. It's oh, okay, I just want to make sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so those are the time bound components at the bottom, which are represented there. Regardless, regardless. Thank you. Dr. Yeah. Bell, I can ask that question. I just want to, yeah, uh, thank you. Perfect. Did you want to close or are yeah. we close? We have uh, one more slide. All right. So, where we are right now is we have a very good list of initiatives. The next phase of our work is going to focus on building the how behind these initiatives. So how do we actually execute on these initiatives? And that would then dovetail into identifying the fiscal needs for each of these initiatives. So that's what's going to come next. We have a meeting with uh, the Central Leadership Team tomorrow, go through our list of initiatives and uh, 
to the next step. Thanks for the follow-up. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, it was very enlightening. I think the more we talk to you, the more you're dragging us along so that you can really understand uh, the methodology that you're, you're presenting. So thank you. We really appreciate it. Thanks. Oh, so much. Yes. Okay. Um, Agenda item number three, discuss central health owned and occupied real property and potential property for acquisition, lease or development in Travis County, including next steps in the redevelopment of central health downtown campus, administrative offices of central health, enterprise partners and new developments in Eastern Travis County. And agenda item number four, receive and take appropriate action pursuant to consultation with legal counsel regarding the current legislative session. Members, I announce that the board is convening in closed session to discuss agenda item number three under Texas Government Code section 551.072, deliberation regarding real property, and Texas Government Code section 551.071, consultation with attorney. And agenda item number four under Texas Government Code section 551.071, Point oh seven one consultation with attorney. It is February the 22nd and the time is 7.45 p.m.
Ready? Okay. Uh, members, we are out of closed session. Uh, we took up agenda items three and four. Um, agenda item three, discuss central health owned and occupied real property and potential. Oh, let me go back. It is 8.43 p.m. on February the 22nd. Um, Agenda item number three, discuss central health owned and occupied real property and potential property for acquisition, lease, and development in Travis County, including next steps in the redevelopment of central health downtown campus, administrative offices of central health enterprise partners, and new developments in Travis County. I will turn it over to Stephanie McDonald. Thank you. And if you can advance the slides for me, let's go to the second slide. Uh, next one, please. So to end the meeting on a high note, here is the progress we're making on the Hornsby Bent Health and Wellness Center. We are really delighted. We are actually um, going to knock on wood here ahead of schedule. Um, next slide, please. So that's the uh, port cochere on the outside um, and then the entrance to the right. This is kind of some of the interior work that's going on. And if you think about in the last time I presented to you, they were just doing the site work. We're already up and that's kind of how fast uh, this has been going. Really excited. Um, IE2 is the, the, the general contractor here and they're doing a real um, great partner with us in this project. Um, next slide, please. Something else really exciting, and um, I want to bring back uh, the playscape at the Hornsby Bend Health and Wellness Center to you all. Um, we have uh, changed out. We now have um, an inclusive uh, playground. Um, there's uh, both adult and ch uh, children uh, friendly activities on this playscape. The kind of bamboo looking sticks in the back are for adults. I haven't quite figured it out yet. Um, there is a, an inclusive, um, accessible um, uh, kind of merry-go-round in the middle, and then you can be wheeled on to this playscape um, as well. And it um, was a little bit more expensive than we had originally budgeted, but we are able to absorb it within the project budget overall. So we're really excited and look forward. We may have to open the site or we may be able to open the site before the playground is fully installed. We are also adding some benches, and um, but we um, are really excited about working uh, with this vendor and, and getting this playscape in place with shade. Um, this was not the right one. It, we had a different version with some, well, you know, I, I gave you some, uh, I already given you an update, an update on Del Valley. We did pour some concrete for the reinforcements uh, this week. And then we'll move to next slide, please. And if you'll just go, um, not me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next slide. Uh, we are in a competitive uh, so proposal process again for the Rosewood Zero Ghost General Contractor Selection. And if you want to go to the next slide, please. Um, I don't know if you've actually seen any pictures. This is kind of the interior. Remember, this is a renovation. Uh, we're not changing anything on the outside, but um, I think you know we're really excited about um, the work that's going to happen at our, the work that has already happened in RZ in the design. And if you'll go one more slide, please. Just um, some of the the care team areas, um, but just. We expect uh, to get those proposals in early March. And then the final slide, please. Um, we are really excited that uh, the city of Austin has concluded the two final steps that allow us to move forward with closing on the land and the Colony Park Master Plan Development Area. That closing is scheduled for March 8th. And David Duncan and Chris Gilmore, who is an attorney at the Travis County Attorney's Office, have been phenomenal. And we are really excited about this. They um, got the subdivision plot approved and um, we have the temporary construction easement and um, we think it's gonna be a go. Awesome. And that is all I have. And I will request that you take action on the item. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, members, I need a motion from the items that were discussed in the executive session. Manager, we I move that the board delegates to their president and CEO uh, authority to execute a lease for real property as discussed in executive session. Manager Matwani. Second. I have a motion for manager Musaifi, but I have a second for manager Matwani. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries. Managers, we are at agenda item number six. 
Confirm the next regular board meeting date, time, and location. Managers, our next Central Health Board of Managers meeting is tentatively scheduled for next for Wednesday, March the 29th, 2023, at 5 p.m. at Central Health Administrative Offices, 1111 East Cesar Chavez Street, Austin, Texas, 78702. This time, I'm ready to accept a motion for adjournment. Manager Valadez. Manager Brinson seconds. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We are adjourned. Thank, Thank you, you, members. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.